live from New York. <laughs> it's the New York Hardcore Chronicles live. What's happening, world? I'm back. Back in the New York groove. I'm back in the New York groove. In the New York groove. What's up? Live from New York City. I'm your host, Drew Stone. Sponsored by Fryan Amplification, New York Hardcore Comics, and the Organic Grill. What's up? What's up? Welcome. I'm home. Back. Back in the fucking New York groove. And I'm fucking stiked. I'm stiked. What's up, Robert? Yo, your shirt went out today. Uh, hi, everybody. Hi, Tanya. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Back in New York, all back in New York City. What's up? <laughs> What's up, Lenny? Right, exactly. Go get my fucking shine box. Yeah, no, no, no. no. Oh, who's feeling my... Yo, I figured it was appropriate for today to rock the SSD control, SSD control shirt. Thank you, Keith. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Gaylene. You know, Vinny, Vinny Doak, I hope, you, I hope you're okay, buddy. I uh, saw you were in the hospital there, you know. Hi, Gina. How you doing? How you doing? Back in New York, how you doing? I'm not in my father's kitchen anymore, right? Fucking stoked on that, huh? I mean, I'm stoked and I'm not so stoked, you know? But uh, I'll, be back to, I'll be back down there soon. Yes, where I belong, baby. You got, you got that right. Um, what else? What did I just, what was that? Whoa, whoa, coming in fast and furious. Pete Campbell, this has been the greatest thing ever, not just during the age of COVID-19, but ever going to your Patreon today. Well, let's get, let's get cracking, bro. Let's get cracking on that Patreon page. Here's the banner. Listen, all you, all you fucking freeloaders out there that haven't contributed, come on, man. It's time to fucking get with the program. There's the Patreon page. Here's um, the PayPal page. Um, what the fuck is the PayPal page? Here's the PayPal page. Yo, throw your hat in the ring. Let's go. Um, the show can use your support. There's a lot of cool stuff on the Patreon page. A lot of cool things happen. Now I'm home. There's all kinds of cool shit here where I live, and I'm going to be putting it on the Patreon page. All my hard drives are here. It's like, like they said, the movie Almost Famous. It's all happening. It's all happening. So there you go. A couple shows coming up. Um, we have on Friday, we have Lukey Luke from Gorilla Biscuits, Lukey Luke Abbey from Gorilla Biscuits and Warzone is on the show on Friday. And then on Sunday, Ooh, spooky on Sunday, we have Steve Zing from Sam Hain and Danzig and all that. So Make sure you stop by for that. Also, we have Christina Lise McCarthy coming up. That is the week after on uh, June 26th. Christina Lise McCarthy, who's an OG Boston hardcore gal, who was there in the early days uh, when me, me and today's guest were around. And she was one of the few girls that was really in the mix uh, back then. And then also the show after that is my birthday show. Starring you, you friggin' bum. There it is. There's my birthday show. June 28th. I'm gonna put the link in, I'm gonna put the link in the comment in the comment box. And everybody's welcome to come on the show. We're gonna have some special guests as well. So that should be a lot of fun. What's going on here? Let me see. Hey May, how you doing? I hope hope London's well. John, how you doing, buddy, in the UK? Nice to see you. Tim Fubar, there you go, from Wales. There you go. Greg, what's up? Welcome home. Thank you. We need an episode where you get interviewed. Well, my birthday's coming up. You know, Laura Zeitlin, what's up, Laura? Are you still down on the Jersey Shore? Andy, Andy, the shirt's on the way, man. The Ace, you know, you know while we're at it, while we're at it, you know, while we're at it, at it, at it, let's, I'm editing. While we're at it, um, let me just say that the A7 shirts, the A7 throwback shirts with all your favorite bands on it 
are on sale. And let me put it said www.stonefilmsnyc.com. Let me find that. Where is that? The A7 throwback shirt right there. www.stonefilmsnyc.com. It's an A7 throwback shirt. There you go. Everybody go out and buy one. And I got news for you fucking international motherfuckers out there. Seriously. I'm yank I'm I am yanking the the international. I'm not I'm not dealing with it. So you guys that got in before the door closed, good for you. It's fucking 26 bucks to ship a fucking t-shirt over the pond. It's fucked up. So it's just not worth doing. A couple of you guys order. It's like it's like an exercise for me. Basically, shipping the t-shirt there's 26 plus the cost. It's basically a break-even proposition. So if you're if you're overseas, you better order them now because I'm taking down the international link really soon. So this so there. Anyway, um, that said, let's let's keep it moving. Um, excited about today's guest. Um, excited about uh, Rap Bones isn't on the show today. Uh, he's out taking care of something. So Rap Bones will rejoin us on Friday, and Sid the Kid, of course, will be on. Sunday, and there you go. It's the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live, sponsored by Fryette Amplification, New York Hardcore Comics, and the Organic Grill. Fryette Amplification is a small company that makes guitar amps, attenuators, and direct recording products in North Hollywood, California. Their gear is used by the Deftones, Helmet, Candiria, Stone Temple Pilots, Powerflow, Antidote, Volbeat, Downset, and many other bands. The brand new Deliverance 2 heads are available now at Fryette.com. Here we go. Let's bring on Steven Messina. Photo of the day. What's up, bro? What's up? You home this Sweet. week? Oh, there's the shirt. Oh, representing. That. You see that? Representing. You see that? It's so pretty. Who's representing, huh? Came out goddamn good, I gotta say. Who the fuck so, is representing? So you realize we got no we got no, no rap bones and no Sid. So huh? as Roger said, there's no justice. It's just us. Oh, don't get heavy. Don't get heavy. Speaking of heavy, how about that last show at Michael Graves, bro? Woo! Amazing. Amazing. That, that was that was really who sells the hat? Um, this is one of Isaac's uh Isaac's yeah, hats. That's, that's a I nice believe. hat. This is one of Isaac's hats. Um so yeah. Yes, shipping it to, to Canada's expensive. It's just fucked up. I I don't. How do they charge twenty six dollars to ship a fucking t shirt? It, it's, it's, uh, it's perverse. Hey Bernardo, I hope you're well, buddy. Um, there you go. Norway, what's up? What's up in Norway, Federico? All right. Are we still going on about the shipping thing? Yeah, it's fucked up, man. Listen, that's fucking, crazy. Oh, you know, let me handle. Hold on, let me handle this. You fucking people that live outside of America, you want a fucking t shirt? Come to New York and get it, all right? I'll be in Tompkins Square Park on, on uh, Saturday. We're having an inform, informal gathering. If you want a fucking A7 t-shirt, come to fucking Tompkins Square Park on Saturday, all right? Other than that, you're shit out of luck, man, all right? Oh, Generation Records has it, huh? Oh, Generation Records Online has this hat. Got it. Okay, cool. All right, getting a little crazy. Yo, it feels good to be home, bro. I got to yeah, say. Yeah, doesn't it? Feels good. I got all my things around me, man. I got all my cool shit around me. I'm, I'm a happy motherfucker right now. Dude, you know? Tell me what's what's behind you there. Show what's behind? What's the, behind the, me? The, the the platinum I see behind you. Oh, the pl the platinum. Well, that that happens to be my double platinum Onyx record from when I did the slam video, and then above that is my typo negative uh, gold record from when I did. Uh, from no, when I did black number one, when I produced the black number one video, and the other one is my run DMC gold record. Oh, nice! And under that is my under that is my my signed photo of Linda Harrison Nova from Planet of the Nova. Apes. Under that is me and my pal John Lydon. Um, oh, that's awesome! Goofing around when we uh, when we shot the Alago film, and then under that is a Stunt Wars plaque. From the team event when I was doing extreme sports films back in the day, uh, over this over this shoulder over there, you can see an all ages poster for the all ages film I did when it screened at the Berkeley College of Music. So, and then and then over here on this side is a 
bunch of local stuff, black and blue stuff, judge, all that, all that kind of stuff. So that's awesome. That's what's going on in my world. You know, that's awesome. Jim didn't make the trip. Hey bro, let's get something straight. I'm very grateful that I have so many international fans. I appreciate it. I'm very grateful for everybody that's watching the show. So I'm just, I'm just busting your balls there, Jurassic Punk. <laughs> you know? So. Anyone who comes from Norway to Tompkins Square Park? Yeah. Respect. on me. Re yeah, right. Respect. You know, yo, um, where's Jim? Yo, I hid Jim. I hid, I hid Jim in my dad's where he wouldn't find it. Because my dad's one of these old timers that throws shit out. He'll find it and just throw it the fuck out. So <laughs> and he's always been like, throw that thing out. I'm like, no, Pop, he's the, you know? So, you know. You should have brought him on the plane as your emotional support animal. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I need this. Yep. I can't fly without him. Yep, yep. There you go. So there you go. What's this? Uh, what's this? I, don't, I don't know what that's about. All right. Yes, the Wall of Fame. That is one of my walls. There's a couple other ones in here. But that's that's the way. There's a, there's another one. There's another one right above me. Hold on. Ugh. Oh, look at that. This is. Uh, hold on. Tell you what this is. Hold on. Oh, I can see it. I'll tell you what this is. This is a this is a goal record, uh, that I got for producing the. Insane clown posse, <laughs> uh, chicken hunting video. Damn. And, um, funny story. Yeah. So th there's all that. But anyway, let's keep it moving here. This is dragging. Out. This, is, this is dragging. It's just good to see everybody, you know. So I'm, I'm sorry. Hello from Milan. What's up? Ah, uh, my people. I'll bust in from Detroit. Come on in, man. Yes, yeah, Saturday. Saturday in the Saturday in the park. I think I want an A7 shirt. <laughs> hey, you know what? Let me let me just say, look yeah. at this. Come on, look how good this looks. Yeah, it looks good, man. All yeah, your man. favorite bands. All your favorite bands are on there. And bands that, if you didn't see them, if you weren't here for that last year, man, you missed something special. Hey, Robert Hogg, yes. I'm thinking I'll be the only dude in Scotland with the A7 shirt. Yes, bro, you will. Because I just brought that shit to the post. I just brought that shit. Yes, K. Sat Saturday. Um, yes. Saturday, K. We'll see. We'll see on Saturday. Um, Drew, you should do a video on your accomplishments, kind of like rallies. You know, that's kind of self. Uh, it's too pretentious, man. It's believable. It's like, it's. It's a little weird. And I did this and I did that and I did this and I'm uh, you know one of I'm these sort of, one of these days will make you the guest and me yeah, say that, you know you. I feel awkward doing that shit. Me me me. There's enough people in the hardcore scene going me 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 me, you know. Ah. So, hey, one thing about Saturday for everybody out there that's listening about about this thing that we're doing on Saturday, we got to be really careful. Um I'm waiting to get the word from Niagara. We're going to be able to buy drinks um from Niagara, but we can't congregate in front of the place on the sidewalk. We have to spread it out. And that's why, you know, I decided to do it is because we have um, Tompkins Square Park right there. So we got to be real careful because we don't want to fuck Niagara and uh, A7 and have them get tickets and shit. So everybody really has to be on top of it and uh, kind of cop and go. You know, if you get a drink or you get food out of the window in Niagara, you know, come into Tompkins Square Park. We're going to be on the sidewalk in front of Tompkins, maybe a little bit in front of A7. But we have to be really careful about this. We, we don't want them to get tickets because it will fuck up our future in, in that particular place. So just just a heads up, you know. Uh, who, oh, sick. Who, who did the T-shirt design? Well, Stephen Messina did the T-shirt design, you know. Um, so, yeah. I, I took oh, hey, little love. Yo, little love. What's the Thulsa Doom shirt, bro? Oh, nice. Somebody's looking. Look at that. Yeah, there you go, bro. Dude. Yep. 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 So. Nah. All right. Enough already. Um, the day. Yeah, hold on. Let me get let me get all this other shit out of the way. 
Yes, congregate in Tompkins Square Park like the old days. A absolutely. All right, here it is, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls of all ages. Photo of the day. Let's see what you sent me. We'll go with the... You know what? You know, I got the ability now to... Now that I have two screens... Uh oh, we're gonna, we're gonna get into. We're gonna. I'm gonna try some shit here, right? We're going big budget now. Yeah, big budget here. All right, let me let me start with this. All mm. right, let's let, let's start with that. So, photo of the day. If you know what that is, let's hear it. Um, let me see. Any ideas? Come on. Any now. ideas? Let's see. Let's see. Anybody, anybody. I know Rob Granger knows and I know he's out there. How about that? How about that, kids? I can rent I could do full screen now that I have two screens. That is friggin' rad. You know? Let me get rid of that. That is rad. All right, what do we got here? Greg and Greg. Boom. Is that right? Yes. Greg and, and Greg. Yes. Um Greg Hetson, yes. Uh, bad religion. Uh, Ryan says, "Is that bad?" We got. Hold on. Bad religion with Greg Hedson. Bad religion. Chris Bunkley. Bad religion. Hedson looking crazy. Now you sent me. A, you sent me a second photo, right? I believe I did. Yeah, you did. Let me. Let me. It, there's a companion photo to this one today. Yes. So, yes. So, um, hold on. Let me. Uh, I'm um, I'm I'm sort of have new technology I'm trying to master here, so be patient with me. Here is the companion to that, right? Boom. All right. Anybody else know what this is? It just so happens that I believe this particular guitar player ended up in a band with today's guest. No, this is not this is not Dag Nasty because Greg get. Greg Graffin doesn't sing for bad, bad, dag nasty, right? Yeah. Well, here's something specific: bad religion at Mulcahy's. Boom! Really? That is a winner right there. No shit. What's Mulcahy's out in out in out in uh, Mulcahy's out in Wonton, Long Island? Oh, Long Island represent, huh? Oh yeah. Wow. In fact, uh, I want to talk right, about tell us about it. This was this is a crazy show. In fact, the lineup. I have one regret about this show. One is regret? That, what, just a, one? It, it was a three-man bill, and we got there just in time as the first band was walking off. And it was uh, Bad Religion, Madball, and Gogol Bordello. And if you've never seen Gogol Bordello live, they're, they're unbelievable. And I didn't even – I don't remember if I knew they were on the bill or not. That's like, a real, that's like a real Laura's Island band. I know she's watching. She loves that band. Yeah, oh, they're great. I've I've seen them, and they're absolutely like there's no one like them. And and right when we got there, they were literally waving goodbye, walking off stage, and we missed them. And then Madball like ripped the place up. And Bad what's it? Anti Flag opened up. It's in Wanta. No, no, it's a different show, huh? Different show. Yeah, they've played there a number of times. And uh, right. this one was was Bad Religion, Madball, Gogo Bordello. Wow. And uh, Gogo Bordello are, are this insane kind of, I don't they're almost hard to even describe. Yeah, they're, they're pretty, they're pretty kooky for sure. They're, I saw them at the sure. Warsaw and they were incredible. Yep. Yeah. She, that's a big Laura Zeitlin band. Uh, she loves them, you know? Oh, they're awesome. They're fun. Yep. That, I'll pull them out one of these days for a picture of the day. We'll do it for Laura. Hey, hey uh, Frankie Too Far, what's up, bro? Here you go. Bad religion with Madball? That's amazing. Is there any footage of that anywhere? Oh yeah, there is. I, yeah, I bad religion. That. Bad religion is great. Everybody yeah. loves bad. Bad religion is a great band. So I, there you uh, go. So, so bad religion. There you go. Yep. And and you know what? Are you are you a bad religion fan, Drew? Yes, I would consider myself a bad religion fan. Yes. In fact, you told a story, an episode. I think it's the last episode or the one before, the one where. Uh, where Biohazard and Bad Religion played together. Yeah, we went to um, 
I was with Biohazard and we went down to Argentina to play in Argentina and they played an indoor like arena, like a basketball arena with bad religion. It was, it was biohazard, bad religion or bad religion, biohazard. And it was, it was one of the, it was really incredible. Is that the show where they, because I have a, an import with a live version of uh, We're Only Gonna Die with both bands together. Is that from I, that show? We did it. It ha they it, it, that happened at that show. I don't know if, but it happened. That happened a couple of times because through the years after that, they would play on whenever they played on a bill together, they would do it together. So it's something. It's something that happened a bunch of times, you know. Yeah, because yeah, that was always for me. As a, I'm a giant yeah. Bad Religion fan, and I love Biohazards. When Biohazard would do that song, yeah, for sure, it was always amazing. And then when they did it together, it was like peanut butter and chocolate. You can't go wrong with that. So. Hey, Scott Solidar. Yeah, how, how Can Hell Be Any Worse will always be my favorite album by them. Yo, I, I was just getting to some bad religion. I listened to Suffer again the other day. Ah, and uh, so man, good. yeah, there, there's, 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 there's so much great. Hey, Vinny's heading to the doctor. Hey, Vinny, uh, wish Vinny, me the listen. best, man. I know, I know, you, I know you're, you're laid up there. Uh, you know, we're thinking of you. And thanks for supporting the show. Always, always. Yeah, man. So, I got all right. I got to say before I close that is our yeah. two friends, Willie Ramone and the Reverend Nikki Bullets are both big Bad Religion fans as well. So we got to shout them out. Our right on, right on. Mom. All right. Well, we'll catch up with you soon, man. We'll see. You we'll, got we'll, it. we'll come back on at the end of the show. Absolutely. All right, man. We'll see you in a bit. Later. It's the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live, sponsored by Fryette Amplification and. Uh, it's behind here. Sponsored by Fryette Amplification, New York Hardcore Comics, and now the Organic Grill. Not to forget our friends at Pitchfork and my dad, Arnie Stone, as well. So there to go. And the Worldwide Hardcore Firing Squad. But uh, right now, let's, let's, uh, let's stay on topic here. Uh, let's talk a little bit about New York Hardcore Comics which opened back in 2013 when lifelong friends Debo to Pro and Lee Fairley combined their collections and obsessions for comic books, punk rock, toys, and statues, magic, the gathering, and all things horror. The store is located in lovely 117 Main Street in Dobbs Ferry, New York. If you want to support them during this pandemic, how much longer is this considered a pandemic? Please contact them via email at newyorkhardcorecomics at gmail.com or any social media channel for an exclusive store package. $20 gets you one of each. Exclusive shop t-shirt and sticker. Marvel Comics Venom number one exclusive to New York Hardcore Comics. That is New York Hardcore Comics. So they love us. We love them. Uh, time to bring our guest on. Let me see. Yes. Go to New York Comic. Com go to New York Hardcore Comics and support them, you fucking assholes. <laughs> there you go. Shout out to New York Hardcore Comics for getting me to Mr. Plow. All right, good. Good. Every a little, a little, a little, uh, a little love here for New York Hardcore Comics. Lee, thank you. You guys are, you guys have been a great sponsor, a perfect sponsor for the show. So, so that's that. So here we go. Uh, let me let me clear. Is it weird to be back after 13 weeks, Drew? Um, yes, <laughs> yes, very weird. I went and got tested today. I got tested. I rode to the subway today. But everything was cool in my apartment. I was a little worried, but it's like a fucking crypt in here. So, uh, so that, that's all good. Um, anyway, here we go. Um, I want to tell a quick story before I bring uh, today's guest on. Um, on. On a previous show, I talked about uh, the first hardcore show that I was ever at. Uh, I went up to Emerson College to study acting, and um, I met, I met uh, somebody in the cafeteria who had his head shaved and I started talking to him and asked him about hardcore, excuse me. And he said, why don't you just come with me to a show this weekend? Well, as it turned out, I had him on the show. That's, that's Jack Choke Kelly, who sings for Slapshot. One of the first people I met when I got up there and I went to my first hardcore show with him. And that first hardcore show was an SSD control show. I think it must've been their third or fourth show at a place called the Media Workshop. And our guest today, there was about 15 kids there, maybe, maybe, maybe 15, 20 kids. And our guest today was one of those 15 kids. 
And I must say, as far as this hardcore game goes, uh, this guy uh, has been a friend of mine for a very long time. I guess it's coming up on 40 years, which is insane. We've known each other since we were teenagers. And uh, he was, you know, back then, you know, there wasn't a lot of like-minded individuals. So anytime that you, you connected with somebody, it was, uh, it was really special. So today's guest is an American musician best known as the lead singer for the hardcore punk bands DYS, Dag Nasty, All, Down By Law, and currently Don't Sleep. He also founded a side project called The Sharpshooters, whose music is influenced by mod revival bands such as The Jam, and for his influence on pop punk music and his early contributions to the emo genre. Here he is, one of my oldest friends in this thing we call American hardcore, Mr. Dave Smalley. There he is. Hey, Drew. Hi, everybody. Hey, buddy. How are you? What's going on? Hey, thanks for coming on, man. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Now, I just want to say for those, uh, Dave's a little, a little, um, a little fuzzy. That's the way it's going to be today. He's, he's a little. Uh, the technology over there is, is what it is. But, but he's got a good connection, and we're good for the day, right? Yes, sir. Hey, so uh, tell us a little bit about uh, what happened. You know, when this whole thing hit, and where were you at musically, and what's been going on? So, uh, yeah, I mean, look, you have to always sort of preface any conversation about COVID with uh, first world problems, right? Like, yeah, I couldn't go on my tour. That's nothing compared to somebody getting sick or dying. So so that that being said, um, it has been a kick in the, you know, in the fanny for, for almost every musician. Um, we're, uh, you know, almost every, about every tour canceled. Huh? Uh, big bands, medium bands, small bands, everything, you know, uh, and then you, you have to sort of extrapolate that out to the club owners, the yep. guys and gals who are putting on festivals that take year to prepare for and, and book and get the equipment and the cr stage crews and the lighting and the sound. So, so multiply out, you know, how it's affected musicians to uh -huh. all the people who make it all happen. And then obviously the fans, all of us are fans first. So, you know, you can't go to see music and music is kind of one of the things about life that keeps life worth living. So yeah, COVID, uh, COVID is a uh, horrendous on the most epic horrendous levels, but uh, on down the line, man, it's been, uh, it's been tough. I had three tours this year uh, go down. So wow, that was, yeah, that was really disappointing. <laughs> that, that sucks, man. Um, what, um, let, let's, let's, let's poke around a little bit. I'm super excited because we're, I, I got some great photos of us from back in the day that, that we're, that we're going to kick around a little bit. Uh, our boy, Rich Zoller, uh, the photographer says, hi, uh, oh, nice. stellar Kevin, photographer, stellar. Yeah, that's, that's our boy. Uh, Kevin brains. What's up, Dave? Hi from the cheese maker, the new band rules. And so do you. Thank you. <laughs> so. Awesome. Yeah, man. Um, tell us a little bit about how you um, did you grow up in a musical home? Like how did music come into your orbit? So I did. And, and in a weird way, though, I think probably different from a lot of people. Uh, my parents had me kind of later uh, in life, you know, and um, my dad uh, came up. So the cool thing about my dad, there are a lot of cool things, but he uh, actually used to hitchhike in to Hollywood from his home in Southern California. He'd hitchhike into Hollywood and go see uh, Benny Goodman and Glenn Miller wow. and, and all those cats. And he would dance with, you know, pretty girls in with Glenn Miller and Benny Goodman, um, yeah. uh, you know, hitchhiking in like a world that we just can't even conceive of today. Right? Yeah, for sure. So, so he used to do that. And then, so I, I got a lot of that stuff. I still love big band music actually. Um, from my dad and then uh but he also was an expert in uh classical music so beethoven nice. mozart and and all of that so so we would be driving somewhere just my dad and and me and 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 he would whistle along with a full orchestra symphony for like not just like a minute for like 10 minutes he would know every note of the flutes and the violins and the cellos and the, mm -hmm. you know, the, 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 the drumming, every, the percussion, everything. So I learned a lot from my dad through hearing music at a different kind of level, I think, than a lot of people do. 
Um, and I never, you know, I know some people went with their dads and I went with my kids to rock shows, you know, mm -hmm. but, uh, I never got taken to a rock show by my dad, but, right. uh, I got taken to the Kennedy center in Washington, DC, you know, to see Beethoven or whatever. And so it's a, a little bit different, but I learned a lot about layering, you know, how the different layers of instrumentation come in on top of each other, mm -hmm. crescendos, you know, uh, different beats, all that kind of stuff that, that was really helpful to me. And then that all translated to me um, kind of finding out I could sing in elementary school and I had a teacher who was super helpful. So, so you were, you were musically involved even before we met as teenagers, you know, in Boston. And so you, 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 you cause, cause for a lot of us, you know, the hardcore thing kind of threw us into a musical environment. You know, a lot of us had no sort of background in music before that, you know? Yeah, and that's one of the joys of punk rock, really. You know, yeah. is the fact that you know, like the Clash said, you know, here, you know, learn three chords now, go start a band, and you know, stuff like that. And yep. um, that that's kind of the joy of punk rock. You didn't have to be a virtuoso, and most of us weren't. Uh, but yeah, I came up with music and uh, sang in church choirs and high school musicals, and um, you know, uh, Bye Bye Birdie and Guys and Dolls, and uh, <laughs> you know. All of that. I still love all that stuff. Huge, huge love. Cool. So I go up to Boston, like I explained, uh, in, in the summer of 81, and I'm going to Emerson, and I end up at the Media Workshop, and I have a picture here. Let, let me, let me, let me, uh -oh. I got, well, it's a, it, it sort of sets the stage for, for the Media Workshop, you know? Um, let me, let me, let me post it up just so people out there can kind of like, get the vibe of what these shows were like in this place. Um, let me see. Where is that fucker? Where I got a lot of pictures in here today. Oh man. Don't tell me I don't have it. That'd be a tragedy. Oh man. Oh man. Hold on. I got to dig this fucker out. Hold on. No worries, man. Yeah, man. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this one's cool. I got a couple of them, man. But uh, hold on. Oh, here it is. I'm sorry. I had it. I had it the whole time. So here's here's a photo of. This is the media workshop right here. Let, let me get let me get these banners off and let me explain to people that uh, what what's going on here. So this is the media workshop. And there's like 10 kids in it, there's more than 10. There's like 15, 20 kids. This is an SSD control show because you could see Springer hanging off the, 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 the pipe. And if you look behind him, you see me peeking out with the leather jacket on my shoulder. That's me at whatever, uh, let's say 18 years old. But the media workshop, uh, that, that, that's, 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 that's one of them. And I have another mm -hmm. one. Of of you and me, and you've seen this one before. This is you and me cutting the rug on the dance floor at the media workshop. That's me on the right there, you know, with rocking the old sweatpants and uh, the old the old sweatpants and combat boot style. And that's you on my right there with the little stick figure drawn on his arm. Tell the people a little bit about media workshop and, and kind of what was going on there. So. Um Media Workshop was uh, owned by a guy named uh, Kevin Porter, um, who uh, was an artist and is an artist. And by the way, I just saw, um, thank you, Drew, for sending me his link. Um, Kevin Porter, I don't know if he's on today or not, but he, he looks fantastic. Like, his, he has not aged a day since 1981, you know? Um, crazy. Like, like He's in good shape. He took yeah, care of himself. Yeah. He's in good yeah. shape, yeah. Yep. It's great to hear. So he actually, you know, allowed these punk shows to these hardcore shows to happen. And honestly, without without a couple of spots willing to do that in every scene, yeah. the scene doesn't the scene doesn't grow, right? It's like a you can put the 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 the, the seed in the uh, pot, right? But if you don't water it, it ain't gonna grow, right? Right. So so to water that seed of hardcore always takes you know takes some fanzine people like like Mike Gitter and and Jimmy mm -hmm. Johnson. You know, yep. in Boston, who did uh, respectively Triple X and Forced Exposure, um, mm -hmm. it takes um, it takes those venues like Media Workshop, like uh, 
Gallery East, and and even to their credit, the channel, right? The channel did hardcore shows before, yeah. you know, any big clubs that I knew of outside of them, besides maybe the 930, would allow it. So so it takes that to water that plan and have it grow. And um, and so so Media Workshop had some incredible shows. Misfits played Media Workshop. Um, obviously that that show SSD. I remember seeing Gang Green. Um, DYS played there, of course. Um, um, uh, you know, and and one of the things that um, I don't know if you have that picture that that we were talking about, but one of the things I remember about you, Drew, was um, so one of the things about hardcore and and punk in general was that especially then there was a real sense of individuality. Um, everybody, a lot of people had combat boots. A lot of people had, you know, torn T-shirts or, you know, but a lot of T-shirts were home drawn, like you drawn, like there weren't any, you couldn't get a black flag T-shirt. There was no place to order it online. It wasn't online. Right. Like, so, so you made your own black flag bars, you know, on your shirt and wrote it in your own. Now, some of the people were more talented and could sense it out and everything. I was just like, hey, Dave, yeah. you break it up. You're breaking up, so, man. So there's Can you What's hear that? me? You, oh, a little bit better there. Go ahead. Yeah, I can hear you. All right. Okay. So yeah, just I was just saying how back in the day you had to be an individual. There weren't any pre-made things. You couldn't buy punk band shirts, and all the shows were homegrown, organic. Um, so so um, one of the things I remember about you was um, you were a fierce individual, man. You were living Thanks. proof of what we were all talking about, what we were all doing the punk rock ethos of be yourself. Um, so you had this jean, this jean vest, sort of jean jacket thing. Um, and whereas you had some punk rock stuff on it, but what really, really stayed with me for, you know, 30 plus years now, you had in bold letters, it wasn't like tiny either. It was big as brass. It said hot tuna. <laughs> hot tuna. So right. that was so uncool in 1982 that it was the coolest, you yeah. know? And so I remember that and I instantly liked you partly because I liked you and we were friends, but also I'm like, this guy's got, you know, stones, excuse the joke, right? Like this guy's got stones. So yeah, good on I you. Took, yeah. Listen, I, when I got into, when I got into music, um, I, I, well, when I got into music, when I got into hardcore, um, I didn't, um, I didn't, what do you say? I didn't uh, turn my back on all the other stuff that I loved before that, you know? Um, I still, you know, uh, Hot Tuna was, is, will always be one of my favorite bands. Yorma Kalkinen uh, is an incredible uh, guitar player that's really inspired me. Uh, he's inspired this new film I'm doing. And uh, mm -hmm. so I never, you know, I, when I got into hardcore, I, I didn't turn around and say, you know, fuck that. You know, I have I have a photo. Hold on, let me dig out. Let me dig out a photo here. I got a photo of that very jacket and me in the van. This is this is us. This is us. Now, th this photo's never been seen. These photos have never been seen. This is a fill and flash photo. It, it wasn't used for the the Boston hardcore film I did, but this is us behind the wheel. Um, this is us behind the wheel going from Boston to New York City to see SSD Control and Minor Threat. And that's me behind the wheel there on the left. That was my van. And I'm wearing the Hot Tuna uh, vest, the, the homemade Hot Tuna vest. And, you know, there are a couple of other, other characters. And also <laughs> there's, there's another shot of looking – to the back of the van from the front. And there you have, that's Jake Phelps, Jake Phelps on the right, the infamous, the infamous Jake Phelps and uh, Paul, uh, Punky Paul, uh, Paul Richards in the middle. And on the left there, that's Jimmy Johnson who started forced exposure. Right. Yeah. And Absolutely. we would go down, we would go down to New York from Boston. We'd all, we'd all pack it. We'd all pack in, in my van and in Al from SSD Controls van, and we would uh, we go down to New York, uh, you know, in the beginning, and and we tear it up. But I got I got a photo, this photo. I don't know if, if this has ever been seen before, but this is a photo of you 
in 1981 uh, at the media workshop. Nice. Yep. Nice. Yep. I love it, man. Yeah. How about that? Like, so, so yeah, go, go on. I'm sorry. So the media workshop was, was, was like our spot, right? Yeah. So, so part of it, right. I think Boston had maybe a little bit more than, I don't know, actually every city scene had a connection to the art scene. We had a weird connection, right? So we had like the, the art people who hated hardcore um, and hated us just because of who we were, <laughs> uh, you know, and, and those people were the ones that triggered, you know, the infamous SSD song, you know, how much art can you take? And, yep. and, and some of the music and some of the art now, but there were a lot of super cool artists that were yep. part of our extended family um, and, and still are, you know, like I'm friends with uh, a, a great um, a guy who's a huge uh, supporter and, and facilitator of the arts in Los Angeles, Matt Gleason. Mm-hmm. Um, I even named a song after him in Down by Law on the first album called Matt Gleason is God. And, and you know, to this day, Matt still, you know, helps stuff happen, right? For the arts, for, for music, for he's just a cool dude, incredibly creative and passionate and, um, and smart as hell. So the, the Media Workshop and Gallery East were both essentially art spaces. Um, and without them, I don't know if we would have had the same Boston hardcore scene that we that we had um, because again, you needed a place to show, to, to do shows and you can see, I don't know how much people can see of the, the, you know, the neats, they were, they weren't a hardcore band, but they were certainly a rock band in that time. And um, for skin. So always I like, straight. I like the, I like the spring is fake straight edge on the bottom down there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that. And That's then the funny. jam, somebody wrote the jam. Yeah. Um, so uh you know, it was, it was our place and that's what builds community and family and our, and our gang, you know, that was our gang. Absolutely. So, yeah, absolutely. Yep. Yeah, man. Um, Those are great times. For sure. And let me see what else I got here in the, uh, in the archive here. Um, you know, another, another place that, that we, we talked about was the gallery East and, uh, Here's a shot, uh, another one of these sort of, well, here's one I like. Here's you tearing it up on the, here's you tearing it up on the dance floor, 1981 or two, you know? Um, Nice. Yeah. Nice. You, you kind of getting a little crazy there. Um, Yeah. I don't don't think this. Those pits were, I mean, people who didn't know, you know, thought it was kind of violent and it kind of was right. Like, I mean, yeah. You know, I mean, yeah, if somebody got knocked down and they were your brother from the from the crew or whatever, you, you helped them up. But, you know, if anyone got in there and was trying to, to do, you know, other stuff, that didn't go well. So, you know. Um, yep. So, yeah. That's here's funny. Our, that's a great shot. I have not seen that shot before. No. Uh, right. Here's our boy, Astoria Lou, checking in. Great meeting you, Dave, 10 years ago. Thank you for signing my original Brotherhood record and getting me in the DYS show at the Bowery Electric. My Story pleasure. Lou. Story nice. Lou. My represent. pleasure. Right on, man. Yeah, listen, you know, a lot of, I'm going to post up a lot of pictures that have never been seen, you know, um and nobody fucking swipe them. That pisses me off. You know, I I posted some pictures that were never seen and they ended up on a website like a couple hours later and you know yeah so can you do that thing like that getty images does like where you stamp i can but them? but i didn't think that by putting mm-hmm. them on my show someone was going to take a screenshot and swipe it you know so yeah it was so let's talk about let's talk about this a little bit uh this is a shot um well this this is a shot from gallery east and this is something from the archive does this look familiar Wow, look at that. Uh-huh. Look at that. Yep. I can see what shirt I had on there. I can't even see. Is that a Meat Men shirt, maybe? Yeah, it looks like a Meat Men shirt. Nice. And that's uh, that must be an early DYS show because that's Steve Bielski on, uh, and we nicknamed him Steve Briowski. Briowski were like these antacid tablets. I don't even know if they still make that. But, you know, <laughs> his, his real name is Bielski, but we instantly nicknamed him Briowski. And, um, and then there's Dave Collins, our drummer, and the bro. In this the this photo yeah. is from the very first DYS show, um, at the very first show you guys played at Gallery East. Wow, yep. far out, man. That's that's outstanding. 
Yeah. So cool. that man, that picture captures a lot. It really does. You know, the, yeah, man. the look of intensity on, on Steve's face and uh, combat boots from me and, uh, yep. you know, uh, yeah. Yeah. So that, so do you, um, we were talking about gallery East. Here's another gallery East shot from back in the day. Uh, this is when SSD control was playing with um, government issue and this, this is a lot of the Boston the Boston crew here. But uh, Gallery East was another one of these spaces that we had um, that we used to, you know, pay rent it for 25 bucks and do a show, right? Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, yeah. yeah, I see Choke. I see, I think that Punky right there. I think there's Al, obviously, playing guitar. Yep, uh, yep. Me, Joe, me, Joe, me. Joe Sack out Joe on the right. Out. Yeah, yeah, for Joe sure. Joe Sack out. <laughs> Love your sack out, man. Yeah, that's back then when you, you know, that that's back then when uh, you know, someone will catch you falling asleep, and that'll be your nickname for the rest of your life. Life, you know. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. that's okay, right? Yeah, you know. Yeah. So tell so DYS so how, DYS came into play, and that you know, tell us a little bit about that. You know, um, DYS were, uh, you know, the the. We were, I would say, the uh, the logical um, next group in the vein of SSD control, right? So, so SSD was the the hub of the wheel of the entire Boston crew, um, and then you know there were like you know four or five spokes of the wheel. You know, if you think of a bicycle wheel, sure. and, and DIS was one of those. Um, you know, we were uh, close friends with those guys and and roadied for them. Um, loaded amps. Talk about media workshop. I mean, the stairs, right? To get up to the media workshop and you had to load up the equipment. It wasn't an elevator a lot of the time. I don't even know if there was an elevator. can't remember, but I just remember many there times. Was, but there was, but we weren't allowed to use it. That's what it was. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so, you know, you had to cut, you know, SVT cabs or whatever else up those stairs. And um, so, so yeah. And DYS was, you know, we were very ferocious in what we did. We believed every, every, uh, every bit of it. Um, you know, I think that's one of the secrets to success uh, of whatever you do in life, whether you're, you know, it doesn't matter whether you're a musician or an artist or a politician, which, you know, not so many of these are straight and straight and believers of what they are. But, you know, you got to believe in what you're doing, um, you know, whatever it is, accountant, uh, musician, doesn't matter. You know, your show right now, you love this show. It's obvious. It's fun. You're having fun. You're, you're promoting, you know, this great culture, this great music. So, so you believe it. You wouldn't be doing this. You know, there's a lot of other things you could probably be doing to make money, right? You're not doing this to make money. But by the way, if you're watching this right now, <laughs> support the show. Really? No. I mean, really support the show. Um, exactly. Put your money where your mouth is. Don't just enjoy the interview. You know, send a donation to keep stuff like this going so that it can survive. Um, you know, so anyway, but I think DYS believed in in who we were and what we did. And, um, it radiated out. Uh, I think it, it radiated certainly into brotherhood, which was our, um, our, our first record. And that first record was on X claim records, correct? Yes, sir. And, and what, uh, give us, uh, for the uninitiated, give us like, what, what was the X claim deal? Basically you, 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 you kind of print up your own, what was, what was the X claim imprint about? Well, so, um, so down in DC, um, you had a, a homegrown record label, Discord Records, um, and basically Discord only did bands within its scene, right? Like you couldn't be on Discord. There was one exception, which was the first SSD control record, right? But uh, but for the most part, you know, you 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 had to be a um, a, a member of that DC scene. Uh, right. They were pr promoting. They were trying to build their scene, right? Which is absolutely as it should be. Um, and then uh, Al uh, did that same approach with uh, with uh, you know up up in our neck of the woods with Exclaim, yep. mm -hmm. and um, uh, you know it, you had to get sort of like with DC with Discord. Um, Discord was a little more of a label, like they would actually help yeah. you know pay for your record, get it stuff. Al sort of said, yes, you can put your album out and use the Exclaim. Uh, you know, moniker and moniker. Logo. Yeah, that's the word I was and, looking for. Yeah, and the slogan and, and the, the logo and everything. So, so uh, DYS is one of those early um, exclaim bands, and very proud, very proud of that. You know, and 
Yeah, and, and I mean, I mean, I think X claim there was only there was the there was uh, the kids will have their say. There was um, the the FU's record, Kill for Christ. There was uh, the DYS record, um, the Jerry's Kids record, right? And maybe mm -hmm. the maybe the second SSD. I think there was only five. Was that right? five? I think it was five X claim releases. Al, if you're out there, chime in. Um, but I think there was only five X claim like releases, if I remember correctly. Yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't. Uh, it wasn't a bunch of them. That's for sure. Yeah. So that makes it even more special. Um, yeah. Right? Yeah. And and so after um, after Brotherhood, uh, you did the other record, which was just called DYS, right? Yeah. And who put that out? So that was on uh, Modern Method, which right. was um, yeah, which was sort of owned by the um, Newberry Comics um, owners, um, right? And uh, we uh, we did that one. That one was a, you know, there was so what happened with the Boston scene, which was very, I think, unique to Boston. All of us grew up loving metal right like rock bands and rock stuff hard rock right alice cooper kiss of course yeah. you know um nugent um acdc um trying to think who else judas priest of course and and right around the time that we were all coming up metallica was just starting to change the world right like with, mm -hmm. with uh, the lightning and kill them all and so that was stuff that we loved and we were unashamed of it and i think in some cultures some cities, I mean, you know, what people now probably need to understand a little bit is that each scene was so different. We didn't have the internet. There was no, uh, you, you formed your own styles and looks and sounds on your own organically. Yeah, of course you'd listen to a Black Flag record and dig it, or you would listen to, um, you know, a, an album that you got that a lot of people were getting and, and loved, Minor Threat, you know, whoever, but, um, you know, for the most part, Boston had its very own sound and we all kind of got better at what we were doing and starting around 1983, 84. And all of a sudden the guitar players like Francois for, for SSD, you know, came on board and he was like, compared to all of our, and most of us, Francois was amazing. Uh, he was, you know, he was a musician first. Mm -hmm. And um, and then, you know, uh, Andy and Ross for, for DYS, uh, we're just starting to bloom like a flower again. You know, you use that analogy of the flower. So, so um, we were learning how to play and just try different things. And so the second DYS record, we're like, just be who we are. You know, we're, we love rock and roll and we're a punk band who loves rock and roll. And that's, that's what that album sounds like, whether you, you know, love it or not. You know? Yeah. And, you know, I got to say that um, that second DYS record, um, you, uh, you sounded you sounded really good on it. You could, you could hold a tune, my friend. And, uh, you know, listen, you know, in one regard, like you said, a lot of bands then were kind of going in this sort of rock direction. And what happened was they started out in the sort of hardcore universe. And when they went into, when they, when they, when they went into the rock thing, sometimes certain members of the band just really couldn't cut it, let's say. Uh, you know, and it's one thing to be screaming in a hardcore band. It's another thing to be trying to sing, to try to sing in key, you know, and you sounded great, man. You have a great voice and you sounded great on that second DYS record. Thanks brother. I appreciate it. Yeah. yeah. I, I remember, uh, you know, we knew that we were taking a chance on it. Right. But look, let's say in a good life, you get 80 years, right. I'm talking from birth to death. Let's say you get 80 years of that till you're, 13 or 14, you're still a kid. And then, you know, let's say 70 on, hopefully you have great last years, but let's say 70 to 85, you're starting to slow down a little bit. So that's not that big of a window of time to take your chance to make right. your mark. And um, so we were just, you know, we were either so stupid because we were young or we were so young that we were fearless, but, you know, we just said, look, this is who we are. And what punk rock had taught us was to be who you are. Hence the tuna jacket, right? Hence the hot tuna jacket. Be who you are, right? And, and no no apologies. Just be who you are. I mean, as long as you're a good person, you take care of your brothers and sisters. But you know, like d don't if you know, I'm I'm half mod, half rocker, you know, and and um, 
I, I, I've always been kind of into school, but also like, you know, I'm, I'll, you know, mix it up with whatever we need to do and music. And so, you know, just be who you are and people can have multiple sides. And that's what the second DYS record was, was guys who were just getting better at our instruments and wanting to be who we were. Yeah, and, and like Jeff Kaplan says, that second DYS record is probably one of the most successful hardcore to rock transition records. Well put, Jeff. Absolutely. I mean, I don't want to mention names, you know, but there's certain bands that try to, you know, you know, reach for that, and it just really wasn't, really wasn't happening, you know. Um, but but so be it. So let me see. Let, let me dig in here. Uh, let me see if I have any any pictures that we haven't. Here's a DYS. Here's a one that you probably never seen. Uh, this is DYS at the Channel uh, in uh, in 1982 or 83. Nice. So, yeah, this is a cool one. No, I've um, never seen that. That's great. Yeah, totally, totally great shot. Yep, yep. So there, wow. there's you, you, you in the in the in the DYS days. And let me yeah, see if nice. I have if I have anything else DYS related here. Um, you know, you know the the photos we were looking at before, uh, the van photos with the hot tuna jacket. I mm. mean, and, and this this sort of plays into uh, so a question that somebody was just asking. You know, a lot of those what, what we were doing then was we were coming down to New York for Minor Threat, and we used to do that a lot. We'd we load up Al's van with the straight edge guys and my van with the not so straight edge guys. And, um, we'd come down and we'd, uh, we tear it up in New York. And, you know, a lot of people ask, let me see if I can find that question. A, a lot of people ask about sort of like the, um, here you go. Uh, New York had its share of many troubles with the DC contingent. How was the relationship between Boston and DC at shows? Hey, that's that's a great question. Yeah, um, it was great. I mean, the the reason that the first SSD control record was was half Exclaim and half Discord was because Ian and Al had formed a very strong kinship. Um, obviously, I came up from from Virginia, um, and and then I moved to Boston in the early days of that world. And in fact, I call myself a Bostonian much more than a DC, and you know. Um, yeah, because that's where I became who I really became, you know, but um, and I thank all of my brothers and sisters, including, you know, you for being part of that growth, you know, but um, so so the scene between D.C. and Boston was very strong. Uh, connections were very strong. We were all straight yeah. edge, well, not all, but most many, um, certainly the, the two main dudes in each scene mm -hmm. um, were, were straight edge and, you know, all of DYS and all of SSD. Well, most of SSD and, um, <laughs> you know, and, and so, um, you know, it, we took all that stuff very seriously. And sometimes I think, you know, Ian might have thought we were a little too hardcore with that. But yep. we certainly all respected each other and the music. I mean, think about those bands like SSD Control, Jerry's Kids. I'll, I'll throw in DYS into that mix, um, you know, Gang Green, um, you know, Last Rites, and then go down the coast. You got minor threat and, and DC youth brigade and GI and, you know, marginal man. And, you know, I mean, just goes on like two amazing music scenes. Right. I mean, amazing. Yeah, we, we definitely, and we used to go down to DC a lot. I mean, I remember being in the discord house and um, we would go down to DC a couple of times, you know, and uh, man, we love DC bands. We love those. Ba I mean, I'll keep it in the eye. I loved those bands, man. I mean, like SOA was a huge influence on me. Minor Threat was a huge influence on me. You know, uh, SSD Control, the kids will have their say. You know, huge influence on me. Um, you know, these are the bands that really resonated for me. Um, and and we, we love DC. And another band that we loved, and I, I'm, I'm going to just, I got another shot here. This is, this is, um, this is back up in Boston. This is at the Gallery East. Uh, this is another great Phil and Flash photo. And uh, this is this is government issue at the Gallery East. And um, oh, yeah. look at that. Yeah. 
Yep. That's great. Yep. So that, for people who don't know, hopefully everybody does, but the singer for a government issue uh, was John Stab, and uh -huh. uh, he was uh, he he is uh, remains of one of the all time great uh, you know front men in American hardcore, but also uh, was a great great guy. Um, yeah, he, he was a friend of mine, and um, yeah. always had my back um, in different situations, and. Uh, uh, <laughs> You know, just a great guy. I miss I miss him. Yeah, you know, he was a unique guy. And I know it, it's been said on the show that I used to give him a hard time. You know, listen, I, I, I was, you know, back then I was I was a young teenager and I, I was very sort of focused on on kind of, you know, my thing and, and like those like those striped pants, those 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 this shot's not in color, but like, you know. I'd, I'd give him a hard time, you know, and, and it, 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 it took a little, little while before I loosened up and could really appreciate uh, the, the, the talent and the genius of, of John. And uh, he was a friend, you know, he was a friend of mine, um, you know, and uh, so there you go. But early on, you know, a lot of us early on, you know, were very regimented in sort of like Boston, skinhead, hardcore you know, fucking tear it up on the dance floor. You know, we're coming in and we're coming in fucking, we're coming in hot. We'd go down to DC um, and we'd go rip it up and they were just like, ah, you know? I mean, they were just like, what the fuck, you know? Yeah. Um, Drew, were you a bully back then? Um, I, I wouldn't consider myself a bully, but um, yeah, maybe a little bit, you know? Um, so, but yeah, I mean, there's that part of it. So let, let's, let's, let's keep it moving here. So this photo, uh, government issue, that's Brian Baker playing guitar, um, mm -hmm. in, in this version of, of, um, government issue. And after the D so after the DYS thing, now I left Boston and came back to New York in 1983. I, I, I basically, I basically crapped out of college. Um, I went to study acting at Emerson and got right into the hardcore thing. And that was kind of the end of it. I, it was sort of hard to, you know, focus up on uh, going to school, you know, when SSD control, when, you know, when I was part of the, part of the, you know, the, the, the Boston crew, you know, and I just, it was hard, too hard for me to focus. And I got into a band at the mighty COs and played some shows and it was an exciting, vibrant time to be, to, to be a part of it. And I, and, and I felt at the time I had some consciousness that this is a, a special, exciting time. And, but after I sort of the school thing didn't, the, the school thing crapped out, um, no sense in wasting money anymore. I ended up coming back to New York and I started the high and the mighty playing the a seven. And then, you know, I got into antidote and then my film career started in this and that. But we sort of fell out of touch a little bit um, at that point. And you you left Boston soon after that. And you went and lived in the Middle East for a couple years. And then you formed a band with Brian Baker. Is that right? Is that how it went down? No, a little bit different. So I stayed. Uh, I was in Boston through close to the end of, um, of uh, certainly through the summer of, of 85. And, um, and then DYS. Uh, broke up. It was like totally peaceful and non, you know, non depressing and non, uh, it was just like, we had to decide whether we were going to keep going on as a, as a metal band or, right. or you know, um, Did, weren't you guys, weren't you guys, excuse me, weren't you guys, wasn't there at the very end there, like a little major label interest? Yeah. From your friend, Michael Alago, my friend, Michael <laughs> Alago, among others. There were a couple of people that were nibbling at DYS as a, you know, sort of a COC, you know, and, you know, and Michael, um, I remember we went down to New York and met with Michael Alago and he, he was great. And, um, you know, just, you know, for people who don't know Michael Alago, first of all, go see Drew's film. Um, who the fuck is this guy? Is that guy? And, um, that and guy. yeah. And, and Michael Alago was this sort of brilliant, um, on a number of fronts, um, uh, guy who discovered Metallica. That's his biggest, you know, I think claim to fame, but he has a lot. And, um, you know, the movie tells the story and he under, he underwent a lot of persecution because of his, uh, you know, because of who he was. And, um, 
so it, it's a great movie and film and, and great, uh, great story of Michael. But uh, Michael was always a sweetheart of a dude. And he brought us down and, and we met with him and he said, look, you guys are sort of still one foot back in the hardcore world, but you're not, you're kind of in the rock world, not even in that sort of like suicidal merging of rock and metal and punk. We were, we were like either going to be big ballad, you know, Aerosmith, you know, type. Yeah, yeah, punk, yeah. Or we were going to be a hardcore band. And he said, when you, when you figure out what you want to do, we're interested, you know, if you, if you go in the more rock direction that you've shown on this last record. And we were like, very cool. But it just, it wasn't the right time for us to make those kinds of uh, decisions. So, um, so we kind of broke up and I, I went back down to DC and uh, started hanging out with Brian and uh, Brian Baker. And uh, he played uh, some of the demos of his new band, um, which was called Dag Nasty. And I loved it, you know, and, um, and he uh, short, short, I started roadieing for them actually. And, <laughs> and, uh, not too long after that, they asked me to, uh, to sing for them. And, uh, so I did, and we, uh, we did a couple of tours, did a short tour with the Descendants, which was great, which is where I, I'd known Billy from the last couple Black Flag shows, and we played with Black Flag, um, and I knew Billy from then in Boston. But then um, when we, uh, when Dag Nasty toured with the Descendants, we played the Greystone uh, in Detroit. Did you do a whole American, did you do a whole run with them? No, it was just a short run, like, I think maybe like, I don't even remember, 10 days or a week. I mean, a right. short run. Um, but, uh, anyway, I got to hang out with Billy a lot then, and that kind of sowed the seeds for, for future things. And, um, and then is that, I, is that, is that four on the floor record? No, no. So this is, we just recorded, uh, can I say, and this oh, is, can a, I say, I, I, right. Yeah, I knew that. Right. Can I say in the beginning of 86 and then, right. um, you know, and, and that was a special record, man. I mean, you could feel it. It was like the energy and the karma was there. It was crazy. The karma was something like I've never experienced, you know, it was very Listen, cool. Bro, you have a nice voice, bro. You do. So Thanks, that, 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 that helps, you know? Um, yeah. and, Thank and you, you, you did the Dag Nasty thing for one record. Yep. And then I got a chance to go to school in Israel, which right. is, um, I don't know if you've ever seen that movie. I'm sure you have, cause you're, you're a, you know, a director and a filmmaker, but, uh, Lawrence of Arabia. Come um, on, bro. Stop. It. I know. I know. Right. Sorry. Sorry. But bro, you know, I my dad was a filmmaker, you know? Your yeah. Dad. So that, that film is, is like this epic film, right? The, the, the cinematography, the shots, the story, yep. the, you know, the, 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 the people who they picked to play the roles were perfect. Mm -hmm. um, to this day, I see a picture of Lawrence of Arabia or some of the people that were in that era with him like the real people and i'm like no no that's not them the real guy is peter o'toole and all right, the rest right, of right, right. Omar sharif and and all these other cats but anyway i loved the freaking desert which is funny because i'm like this you know guy with scottish english irish heritage who can't mm -hmm. be out in the sun for more than 10 minutes you know so i loved it and um i just i had a chance to go so i took it and i went and and you, how long were you over there just a year. I went from my first year of grad school there. So studied yeah. studied politics and Middle Eastern affairs in the Middle East, you know. Were you in Tel Aviv? Where were you living? Jerusalem, in the old city, in the in the old city of Jerusalem. Oh. Yeah. That's awesome. It was, it was epic, man. I, I tell you, Drew, I haven't told this story many times. I used to go up to my rooftop of our apartment, right? And you could see the Wailing Wall and the Dome of the Rock. Uh, which is the Al-Aqsa Mosque, this gold domed thing that you know is famous from pictures, and of course the Wailing Wall, um, which right. is the wall of the uh, the temple, the first temple, and uh, you could see it from my rooftop. Wow. So I would go up to my to the top of my roof and just sit there and hear the call to prayer from the from the Dome of the Rock. And wow. I mean, it was it was pretty epic. You know, I have I just shot in the Middle East for my new film. You know. And I found uh, some pictures of you like talking about that. What's what's the film about? Hold on. You know what? Who wants to see the trailer for my film? Hold on. I do. Yeah, yeah. Hold on. Let me let me find it. Why isn't it not opening up? Hold on a second. That's odd. Uh, let me let me find it. Here it is. 
Okay, so we're going to do something kind of crazy here. What does this run? Uh, it's three and a half minutes. I don't know, man. It's your call, um, man. It's your show. All right, hold on. Or you make, or you show part of it, whatever you want. Oh, I don't want that one. I, I don't like that. Well, hold on. I'm on it. Give me a minute. I'm on it. I'm on it. Hold on. Here it is. Okay. All right, stay with me here. All right, you'll appreciate this, bro. Of course I will, man. You're going to love sure. this. You're going to love this. Let me just... Okay, so I am going to... I'm going to break with tradition here. I'm, I'm going to play the trailer for my new film. It hasn't been released publicly. It's not, go, it's not coming out for a while, but it's something different. And being that we're in a Middle Eastern groove here, uh, I'm going to go for it. So uh, here we go. Here's the trailer for um, my new film. Uh, hold on. Let me get this. Let me get this right. I'm trying to get a, get a command of the, kind of get a command of the, of the technology here. Here we go. <laughs> My name is Drew Stone. I'm a documentary filmmaker and musician born and raised in New York City. I'm also a music historian whose passion for knowledge and adventure has taken me to Israel in search of the historical connections between music and religion. Because the sun is going to shine my back someday. Along the way, we discovered that for some people, their religion and spirituality is communicated through music, the universal language. People from many different cultures really connect to the music in a very direct way. All religions have this in common. It's how they speak to God. So come on. The only way that I can give myself to God is through singing. Witness firsthand the diversity and mix of cultures. Yemen. Blues for me, it's a key word for soulfulness. Ethiopian. I can't be that blues singer from the States because I'm not. I'm bringing myself into the blues, making it my own blues. Moroccan and many others. Blues is a feeling. It's not a form of chords. It connects with people, you know, it connects people all over the world and region and no genders and whatsoever. Where is God? Where you let him in. Where is the blues? Where you let it in. All Jewish, all Israeli, bonded together through music and religion. We are talking about music of the soul. Everybody's got their own number and everybody's got their own shoes but I know everybody's got their own blues. The first blues singer was King David. He was the first one who taught the world how to write exactly what's coming out of my heart. Join me and experience the sights. Here we are up at Masada, rich in Jewish history. Sounds and the unexpected. I play the blues and I do it in Hebrew. On this incredible music and spiritual adventure. It's the roots. People like the roots. The original documentary film, The Jews in the Blues. The sun's gonna shine in my back door someday. Yeah, man. There you go. Well, there you go, dude. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm very moved, brother. Yeah, listen. You know, I, you know, I, I, I wanna, I wanna address something because Alberil, Alberil, um, posted something before, and it kind of ties in with, it kind of ties in with this a little bit let me find his comment um where is his comment 
Hold on. Give me a second. Where is it? Here, here we go. So Al Burrell from SSD Control says, does, does Dave ever wonder and think about how his life would have turned out if he didn't meet the Boston crew? Same question to Drew. I mean, do you think it would have been a better life? Any regrets? Well, I could speak for myself in that, no, I, I, there's no regrets there. And if there's one thing that I, that, I, that I really picked up from those days is do your own thing and be true to yourself. And that still carries on through my filmmaking and everything that I do artistically. I mean, what were you expecting? For me to do another hardcore film? Come on, really? It's like, I'm going to do wherever my heart takes me. And that's what I do with my art. And that's something, that's one of the, the, the really the main things that, that I took from, you know, the scene that, that we had, you know, back then, Dave, when it was you and me and Al and, and Jamie and Choke and, and, you know, that's, that's so regrets, I, regret what? I mean, that, 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 what I learned in, in those early days, uh, I carry with me to this day. Yeah, absolutely. So that's, first of all, I love that question. Um, I love Al. Uh, he's always been kind of my uh, big brother slash hero. Uh, uh, all the way back you know, so many years ago and um, inspiration on a number of fronts. Um, those who followed him on, on his, uh, you know, on his, on his Facebook know that he's, you know, dealt with some incredible uh, uh, physical challenges and has overcome them mm -hmm. um, and overcoming them. Uh, so he's, a, he's an inspiration for, for me for my whole life. Um, but uh, so it's a great question, but I think ditto for what you just said. Um, it also, so yeah, would, would maybe, would you and I have taken different paths and not had some of the, the you know, the bumps in the road and the, in the gutter times that we had maybe, but also we wouldn't be who we are right now. And uh, I think I'm a good person who, you know, has made a positive dent in the world. And that's what yeah. I try to do. And, um, you know, and try and encourage people to, like you say, be themselves and to take care of each other and um, make the world a little bit better place uh, before you check out of the hotel. Right. So, yeah. um, you know, so so without that Boston crew, without that, without Al Burrell, without, you know, Jamie and you and Jonathan and et cetera, on, you know, down the line. Right. Um, that, that small group of people help form the good parts of who I am. So, uh, so I would say, no, I think if I hadn't had that, I would definitely have a different life, but it, I, I'll, I'll take the one I got. Yeah, man. There you go. Hey, uh, will you hang with me a second? Let me shout out the sponsors and, uh, and we'll, we will continue. We'll continue in our, in our, in our quest. It's the New York Hardcore Chronicles live sponsored by Fryette. Amplification, New York Hardcore Comics, and now the Organic Grill, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. And I'm back in New York City. Vlad, I'm coming down to the Organic Grill soon, man. Fucking hungry, bro. Should come down tonight. Organic Grill is a vegan restaurant located in the East Village of New York City at 123 First Avenue. Featured in New York Magazine, the New York Times, and Veg News, their dishes have won numerous awards, including Best Veggie Burger. They make their own Cheeses, sausages, and burger patties, and every dish on the menu can be made gluten-free. This year, they're celebrating their 20th anniversary, and they're all about having a great time while enjoying amazing clean food. After three months of being closed, they're now open for deliveries. Get in touch with them and order some great fucking food at www.theorganicgrill.com. There you go. Organic Grill is back in action. New York Hardcore Comics up in Dobbs Ferry. We love you. Thank you for supporting the show. Fryette Amplification, Steve Fryette and Zum, thank you so much. You're my first sponsors on the show. I appreciate, I appreciate everything that, 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 you guys, that you guys have done. Yes. Yes, Organic Grill. Yes. Uh, our guest today is Dave Smalley from many a band, including DYS, All, Dag Nasty, Down by Law, so on and so forth. Um, Drew, if I decide to make a movie of myself, you are my director, producer, all the above. Well, thanks, man. I, I, I appreciate it. There, there you go. Uh, I'd be honored to make a film about you. Um, there you go. Um, 
Amazing job on that sneak. Yeah, listen, why not? There's my new film. The cat's out of the bag. Fuck it. What else? Um, let me see. Well, my list here. We've got upcoming shows. Uh, this Friday is Lukey Luke from Gorilla Biscuits. Sunday is um, Steve Zing from Danzig uh, Misfits. Uh, the Wednesday after that, uh, looks like it's going to be Chaka from Burn. And from Orange 9mm, then a week from this Friday is going to be Christina Lisa McCarthy. And the show after that is going to be my birthday show starring you. Uh, I want to thank everybody uh, for supporting the show above and beyond the call of duty. Uh, a couple patrons came in today, and I really appreciate it. It's your support is what makes this show happen. I know there's a lot going on out there in the world. So I really, man, when somebody steps up with a couple shekels, uh, that, that, that really, it, I, I'm telling you, I'm an, I'm an independent fucking filmmaker. And when people support me in that regard, it really means the world to me. So thank, thank you so much. The show's a success and we're going to keep plugging it. I, I will say though, that I'm thinking that we're going to cut the show down to two times a week. Um, and, uh, it's doing three, I think, um, doing three shows a week, uh, is, is a bit tough. Um, especially with what's going, people are getting out now a little bit. I'm thinking of doing uh, the show Wednesday at three and Sunday at three. So we're looking at Wednesday and Sunday. Uh, it's probably going to be a couple weeks before, before that happens. Uh, thank you, Al Burrell. Yes. The title of my new film is the Jews and the blues. And I'm glad that you find it fantastic and interesting. I appreciate that. Yes. Steen uh, burn. We're, we're getting, we're getting that together. So um, our guest, like I said, uh, is is Dave Smalley, uh, an old an old dear friend of mine, good dude, a good dude, you know. And uh, so let's bring Dave back on. Hey, any questions? Let's ask Dave some questions. Let's get into it. You know, we 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 got uh, we got a little bit of time here. So how about some questions, Dave? What do you say? I'm ready. Yeah, let's see. What people, uh, what people, what people come up with. Oh, but you know what? As the questions are coming in, so so we got as far as the Israel thing, right? And tell us about how when you came back from Israel, how you how you fell in. I know I know you mentioned um, uh, what's his name, um, Bill, Bill Stevenson. Bill Stevenson, yeah. Right, and and tell us about how you fell in with all. What what was the timeline with that? So actually Israel plays into that too. So there's, there's, uh, I'm over there in Israel, uh, just, you know, living that kind of dream life, you know, going to, going to school, um, and, and going up the top of my roof and seeing the, the, uh, the dome of the rock and the wailing wall and going through the, I, I saw that shot from your preview of, you know, you were walking through the, uh, the narrow Arab shook, which is market, um, uh, there. And um, that's in that's in Jerusalem. And um, I, I mean, that was my daily life. Right. And um, so it was it was fantastic. And then uh, but I did miss music. And um, uh, somebody sent me uh, the first uh, or the, 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 the next Dag Nasty record. It was actually Mike Gitter um, sent that to me, who did a very great Boston fanzine called Triple X. Yeah, and um, and he sent that to me and a couple of people sent it to me and. I actually remember being in my apartment in Jerusalem and, um, and I cried, I cried when I heard that record because we had been doing some of those songs before I quit tough, and man. I heard it and, and I've I been wished, there, bro. Yeah. Right. Right. You know? And, uh, so I wished that I had, had done that record and I knew that, uh, you know, I was, I was not done with the music yet and as dorky, as I was, I wasn't going to be a full dork and just be an academic, you know, forever. So, um, so then Mike uh, hooked me up, or I forget, but somehow Mike was involved in hooking me up with uh, with Bill to get my number uh, in Israel. And Billy Stevenson called me, uh, and we talked for hours. And this is, you know, th this is when rates were expensive. I mean, to call Jerusalem <laughs> was was right. brutal. Right, right, like right, right. Bill told me afterward that his phone bill was like a thousand dollars. Because we talked many times, and he wanted to ask me to join the next. Uh, you know, in, in, just like what I done, Milo was going back to school, so the descendants were going to go uh, away, and he wanted to form this new band called All, and he had a vision for it, and um, 
it was a great vision. Go for all, you know, don't, don't leave, you know, don't leave anything behind, you know, put everything you've got into the race. Right. And yeah, um, man. if you have energy after a marathon or after a race, you didn't run your race. Right. You know, that's why if I come off stage, I have to be, if I'm not physically exhausted, I didn't do a good job. There you, you go. Know? And, um, so, so Billy and I talked a lot and, um, so I said, yeah, I, 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 of course, you know, who doesn't love everything Bill Stevenson has touched, um, you know, black flag descendants. And, and, yeah. And of course, you know, Bill Stevenson is part as is really part of that, you know, black flag camp, which really paved, paved, there was, you know, the road for, for, you know, for so many of us with that incredible work ethic. Yeah. Incredible work ethic. Yeah, absolutely. That's the right words. Yeah. yeah so, man. so, I mean, I, to show you that work ethic, I, I went back to, uh, I, I was either going to stay in Israel and keep going to school or I was going to go join this new untested band with Bill and, and, uh, Stefan and Carl. And I'm like, yeah, you got to roll the dice, you know, you got to roll the dice. And if it's something that your heart is telling you to do, that's, that's my lesson in life. Roll the dice. And so it doesn't work. Sometimes you roll snake eyes, right? Sometimes you know you don't make it. But so, um, it, it, but at that point, Milo went to college, and again, again, Milo, again and yep. um, where they they were just really they were looking for another singer with the same guys and to to start a new band. Yeah, but the the really important thing about all that that I really wanted to make sure with Billy is that. I didn't want us to just do descendant songs and yeah. and be, you know, be a, a descendants junior. I wanted us, right. we all wanted to have our own sound and thing. Sure. Um, so, so we, we did, I mean, all is a very distinctive group. Um, and uh, I still love it to this day. Had some amazing times on tour. Talk about the work ethic, man. We, we lived it. We breathed it. We lived together uh, Four men uh, in a, in a, you know, sleeping in a, basically a big closet, uh, with bunks, um, Oof. you know, um, uh, we toured, I was on the road for about nine months out of my uh, first year in that band, um, on the road. And these were like, this wasn't staying at, you know, Sheraton and, you know, you know, four seasons hotels or anything. This was crashing on people's couches and, um, you know, uh, four guys to a room, five guys, six guys, if you included the crew, um, in a hotel, I mean, it was, it was tough, right? And, uh, yeah. So here's that sort of plays in with our question um, from Lenny uh, from Crazy Eddie, uh, the guitar player, one of our A7 guys. I have a question for Dave. When you decided to leave all, was it the crazy workload that made you leave or was there something else? Yeah. So, so great question. Um, so it was a little bit of both. It was, it was, it was related to the something else, which is, you know, I, I had a, you know, girlfriend at that time and, uh, wanted to be home a little bit and, um, and, and missed, um, sort of, you know, that a little bit of normalcy and waking up in the same bed every day, you know, able to, uh, you know, have clean clothes and all that. Um, so, but yeah, I just wasn't used to it. I, you know, keep in mind with DYS and Dag Nasty, we'd only done short runs a week, yeah. two weeks, right. yeah, you yeah. know, to be on the road for nine, nine and a half months out of the first year, um, was, was pretty hardcore, you know, and I, I needed, uh, you know, I did it. I gave it a hundred percent. Like I always do, you know, you just, you go, right. You do it, you give it everything you got. And then, um, if you can't do it for real and do it with everything you got, then you stop. So I had to, I had to make that call to, to and so, know. so you, you're just, you're, you're on that. You're on the first all record, correct? First two. First two. I'm sorry. Two. Yeah. The, 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 the first two. Yeah, so yeah, Bill Stevenson's a fucking workaholic monster. Yeah, I mean that; those guys are but, notorious. But he's he's yeah. also using that work ethic, and I think we all are, right? Like I am. I work my butt off. I, you know, down by law later became a road warrior band, right? Like we toured a lot in Down by Law, but I think it, it took that experience in all to, you know, to sort of um, put some salt and pepper uh, into my uh, touring spirit. You know. Here's a here's a here's a comment from Steve uh, Inamorita. Great show was Down by Law opening for All at Irving Plaza here in New York. Dave came out to sing a few with All. I didn't know. I did not know that. 
Yeah, so so we uh, we played um, with all a few times, and then the the course the one of the most famous times with Down by Law and all was when uh, uh, Chad had lost his voice, and they flew in Milo out of retirement, quote unquote. You know, to sing at City Gardens, right? So it's City wow. Gardens in Trenton, New Jersey, and sure, sure, down by law and and uh, all, which but then it was the Descendants set and um, right, right. Legendary time, yeah. We're all friends. Um, you know, it's a brotherhood, right? You and I, how many decades? You know, me, you, Al. Um, you know, there's a very small group who are still here who were from that era, and that's a bond that you can't replace um, with anything else. You know. Um, uh, I, I, you know, I can only equate it with I can imagine being in combat. Um, I, I, you know, have never been in combat, but I, I know that I've read that there's a fraternity that comes from that. Um, and and uh, I think whatever it is that forms those kinds of special bonds, uh, they last for the rest of your life. So, yeah, certainly that's the case for me. You know, um, here we are all these years later. And listen, I've said this to you before, you know, there's, there's not a lot of guys that are still a lot, of, a lot of guys from that initial scene that are still in the game. You know, you're one of them, you know, Jack Kelly from slap shots, a, another one of them, you know, Rogers, another one, you know, Vinny. And, you know, I've just, 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 we're, we're, we're a rare breed, you know, that, that we're, we're still, it's still in our heart and, and we're still doing it. There's, there's still, there's a couple of us out there, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and you've mentioned Vinny and Roger and, you know, that pe- among that group of people that have been doing it since, you know, since the early days, um, there's this enormous love and respect, you know, like, I mean, I regard, you know, Roger Moret and, and Vinny, you know, Stigma as ideologic, you know, as like we're brothers from, mm-hmm. from the music, right? Like, yeah, man. even though I don't see those guys, I don't, you know, I don't live in Arizona you know, or New York. So I don't get to see those guys all that often, but we've played together and, um, yeah, man. you know, um, played together in France, I think was the last time with the Bandoleros and uh, we played with, with, with the AF it was great. Great. Here, here's, here's an interesting um, one. What does Dave think about being in one of the first bands labeled as emo? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, that term came about after us, or at least as a joke, um, you know, because there was a band called Rites of Spring. Right. Um, at that DC time. band. And, and, and us and a couple of other bands uh, that we played a little more emotional hardcore, right? Like it, it, we were getting better at our instruments and better at singing. And, mm-hmm. and um, you know, and there were all these rumors that people, especially at Rites of Spring show, would, would be crying, sobbing. <laughs> during their set, you know, and as a hardcore dude, that's, that's like not my thing. Right. So, um, right. but, uh, you know, but, but nonetheless, nobody ever cried or wept at, at our <laughs> show. but, uh, somehow that label got put on us and, um, <laughs> look, I mean, can I say means a lot to a lot of people. So I'm just so grateful and, uh, you know, for, for what it has done for so many people. So, uh, yeah, I got, I got no complaints. If people want to label it, that's cool. Hey, uh, so tell us, so, so all comes to an end and then, um, down by law starts up and you had a nice little run in down by law there. You, 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 you got signed to Epitaph. You did a couple records. I mean, I, I, I remember coming out and seeing you in, when you played at the, at the whiskey back then. And, and, uh, tell us a little bit about how down by law came to be and, and how did you end up on Epitaph? So, uh, we were just, uh, formed with the. So when I was in all, we played a bunch of shows with a band called Chemical People, um, who were also on Cruise Records, which was our record label, which was owned by uh, Greg Ginn um, from Black Flag and SST Records. And he started a new record label called Cruise Records. And so we were uh, label mates, all and uh, Chemical People. And we played you know, tons of shows together. And we even ended up at one for a long time. We were practicing at, at uh, Dave Nasworthy's house. Um, so I'm sorry. So Cruise Records was sort of like a, a a sister label of SST. Yeah, yeah, yep. So okay. um, so we we were really close friends with uh, with Chemical People, and um, like I said, did a lot of shows uh, 
you know, had some crazy times mm -hmm. together. And, um, and then I wrote a few songs uh, after um, I left all. Um, and they were kind of different from what I had been writing for all. They were, they were definitely more in the um, melodic hardcore, you know, side. And uh, so I called up the guys in Chemical People and asked if they would be willing to, um, to, to play uh, those songs with me just to try it out, you know? And mm -hmm. uh, they were they were psyched, so we played them, and they were we were like, oh, this is really pretty good. So down the drain and um, American uh, Dream and uh, a couple others that were the first four or five songs, and um, and then we played a show one night at the Coconut Teaser. We only we didn't even think we were going to do shows. The we Coconut show. Teaser, good you remember one. that place, right? Oh God! So it's the size of like you know a postage stamp. It's the and, size of the A seven. Yeah. But uh, we played and with Green Day, actually, and they were just coming up. Um, and um, so Brett uh, Gerwitz from Epitaph was at that show, and he, mm -hmm. he was totally psyched. He, after we played, he said, hey, you guys are great. Come out to my Volvo. Let's talk. So <laughs> we went out to Brett's uh, Volvo, and we talked. And he was like, yeah, I, I love you guys. I want to put you out. So it was so, great. So – down by law was more, chemical people more morphed into down by law. Yeah. So there were a couple of changes along. I the did way. not know that. Yeah. A couple of changes along the way. So, you know, people changed out, you know, at the, it's very difficult to keep one lineup throughout all time, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. but um, mm -hmm. have different lives and different callings and things, you know, but, um, but yeah, the original, the original down by law was me and chemical people. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's incredible. Yeah. Hey, let, and and so you end up on you end up on Epitaph, and yo, there was a minute there when you know the, the when Epitaph was really blowing, you know, was was the label. You had you know Bad Religion, who who sort of stepped off to a major, but you had Bad Religion, The Offspring, Pennywise, um, and then really fourth in the door was Down by Law. Really, I mean for a moment there. You guys were really, you, you guys were really proficient putting records out, touring, and, and you were in the mix there, man. That must have been a nice run. It was fun. Still is fun. I mean, again, getting back to the earlier, you know, theme of the conversation, you, you do what you do because you love it and whether or not it's, um, you know, success or not success, it's irrelevant, um, you know, but uh, we were, we were happy to be uh, you know, on doing warp tours and and uh, playing some pretty big places, and I remember we played a, a warp tour show at the um, the Reading Festival in, oh, yeah. uh, in England. There was a yep. warp tour stage, and and it was a bunch of bands, and then Down by Law, and then Pennywise was going to be the uh, the headliner. And I was looking out at this just you know sea of people, right? <laughs> The They're Reading all, Festival, down yeah. Down by law, down by law. And I'm like, oh, man, you know, and Fletcher, who's this, you know, super big dude, um, a very, you know, super great guy and friend of mine, but he's a guitar player for Pennywise. And he patted me on the shoulder and he said, all right, Dave, it's your moment. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. Thanks, Fletcher. You know, and, uh, you know, we went out and it was great. And, you know, you had 5,000, 10,000, whatever it was, people singing along to Gruesome Gary and, you know, down the drain and all that stuff. So it was cool. And and you still, every now and then, uh, down by law, you dust it off and you go out and play some shows, correct? We do, yeah. So so my musical friend and partner for the last, you know, since 1992 has has, uh, has been Sam Williams, who's a mm -hmm. phenomenal guitarist, right? Like just, he's got such a beautiful sense of melody and, and song structure and his leads. You know, he's one of those kids that grew up, um, playing Van Halen songs instead of doing his homework, you know, mm -hmm. um, he'd come home and like put his, put his guitar on and, and headphones and be playing along. And so he's, he's this just phenomenally gifted guy, but even more important than that, he's a great guy. And um, so, so since he's, he's come into, you know, my musical life, uh, you know, he's, he's my musical partner and we've been doing down by law and, you know, different, uh, different lineups, uh, great lineups, all of them, Angry John and, and uh, Hunter and, um, you know, Kevin Koss and, uh, you know, a lot, just some great players. Um, but uh, we've been been going and our last album is called All In and mm -hmm. our next album is going to be called Lonely Town and it's coming out sometime soon. Yeah, our boy Jeff Kaplan says, Down by Law have put, Down by Law have put out like four records in the past 
few years as prolific as they've ever been. You know? Yeah, so, thank you. Yeah, man. So um, our friend Michael, uh, uh, Don't Sleep, Any Plans, new LP. Let's talk a little bit about sort of your main focus now, which is Don't Sleep, right? Tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, so uh, Don't Sleep came about um, – this is why I love life is when unexpected, happy things happen. So, so um, one of the guys in a band called very Americans uh, uh, sent me some songs, just on, you know, Facebook to say, Hey, we're all fans of yours. Can you listen to our band? No problem. Um, gotcha. The second song I'm, I'm thinking this band is so great. They're just, they had a great uh, pop, vibe um they were obviously talented songwriters uh, their singer was great um you know the mel the melodies that the guitar player was playing were great and uh, everything was fantastic and so i, I wrote them back to get to get you know hey and i <laughs> love it you know and and so that's you know we couldn't do that in 1982 right but uh, yep. now we can and so so i ended up going up to uh, harrisburg pennsylvania and, and harrisburg pennsylvania yeah that's where the guys are from that's where the guys are from yep and i know we, we talked and had a great time really a bond they played with me on a couple of solo shows that i was yep. doing and um then they came out and we did a few dag nasty songs for an encore of mine which was great and um and uh uh, you know, we just clicked musically and then they asked if they could write some songs and uh, they did. And I, I heard them and I was like, yeah, OK, sign me up. You know, I'm in. So now this album, I guess, is the question, what are you guys doing now? But the Don't Sleep album is coming out. It's going to be called Turn the Tide and um, it's coming out, I think, in the beginning of September. Um on Mission Two Entertainment Records, which used to be Victory, right? And, oh, that's uh, right. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's it's honestly one of the best records of my career. It cool. Um, Good. Uh, the guys just killed it. Killed it. And so. uh, yeah, a, a little known fact that that I, that I want to hip to 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 some of our people out there that may not know this, but you. And, and your band of, of uh, guys from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, you guys in, in a sort of um, indirect way were, were slash are responsible, responsible for putting these whole A7 um, series of shows that I started in motion. Because even though you haven't played there, what happened was after I did the video for the take, um, one of your guys got in touch with me and um, asked about, oh, are you booking the place? You know, we'd love to come and play. So that kind of, that was the first thing that got me thinking, well, maybe, maybe it'd be cool to resurrect the old A7. You know, Dave Smalley's new band wants to come and play. So that's what set the whole thing into motion. As it turned out, you guys couldn't, didn't play the show, couldn't play the show. But you really, in an indirect way, got the ball rolling. And then I had you booked for another show, and you you you, you couldn't play that show. So you fucking owe me, bro. You're coming to the A7, and you're fucking playing, bro. I don't want to hear it. All right. It's a deal. You're on tape. <laughs> it's on videotape, two-inch audio tape, whatever. Listen, bro. Yeah. You, the, yeah. it, the, you know, twice. You you got to come and play. You got to come with your boys because you really, you really were instrumental in getting that room – uh, rolling again because that got me thinking and then I talked to Jesse Mallon and we figured out hey let's give it a shot we'll make the shows free and da 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 and you know those shows those shows were were incredibly successful and all we were doing now is we're just really hoping that you know when this thing blows over that we can resume you know our 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 thing there and our with our with our family and, yeah, uh, absolutely. It's a done deal. We're, we're going to be there. And it, I think it'll actually be better for, for everybody, you know, uh, hopefully when this whole thing is, is you know, the, the health stuff is better. But also uh, when the album is out, yeah, uh, we really yeah. have to have the opportunity to, to cl I'm, I'm, you know, I don't like to, to do the hype thing because I don't usually do that. But I will say this album is pretty phenomenal. Um, it's got a magic and a karma to it that is not every day. Hey, so, look who look who just you know. showed up! Our old friend Jamie from SSD Control. Nice. What's, What's happening, happening, buddy? 
What's welcome up, to, brother? Welcome I'm to the party. We, we we already posted all the cool SSD control pictures already, dude. And uh, Al, Al, Baril, Al Baril already came through. But Jamie, you know, thanks for coming through and we, 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 we appreciate it. Yep. A7, do it, man. You know, you got, listen, you got some, you know, some people here in New York love you, bro. So, oh, you know, you, my, you, I mean, honestly, you, I look, I'm, I, I, I can't, you know, down by laws of West Coast band. So I have definitely deep roots in LA, Southern California. But um, look, I came up in DC and Boston and have my, you know, my New York, New Jersey brethren are, are uh, very near and dear to my heart. And I've got a lot of um, insanely great memories, um, you know, in New York. So a seven being one of them. Um, yeah. So, you know, uh, you know, just, just that, that, that is my family. Right. So, so, you know, you and, 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 uh, the, the, the black and blue guys and, and just, you know, it goes on and on, um, the, you know, all the folks in long Island and, and, uh, two man advantage and, you know, just it, it, all the folks in Staten Island and, you know, it just, there's a lot of, of the boroughs, you know, plus the, obviously in the city, um, you know, cause every, I got a lot of close friends in New York and, it's a home away from home for me. I want to. Um, OK, I got I got a picture here um, for all our A7 people out there. And this is the picture that hangs that is hanging in the A7. Right. And this nice. is the picture. And you are in this picture. If 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 you you could see. For, for, and of course, there's Jamie. This this was this was an SSD control show. Yeah. Um, this was an SSD control show. So there's Jamie playing bass, and then you see Doctor No there with, with the cap on, right? Yeah. And then past him is Kate is Katie the cleaning lady. Yeah. Standing next to Nick Cooper, and you're right behind him. Oh yeah. Out yeah, there. yeah, yeah. There I am. Look at that. There wow. you are, bro. Wow. So this nice. photo. This photo. Is we, this is like our shrine in A7. Everyone knows this fucking photo. Bro, you are in wow. this photo, dude. That, that is a true honor, man. That's so great. I love it. I love yeah, it. man. That's that's that makes me makes me very happy. I mean, you remember coming down for these A7 shows, right? Of course. Yeah. They yeah. were wild. They were wild. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they were they were wild. Yeah, there were some there were some good times and some a couple rough times and yeah. all um let me there was a couple another question here let me find that um what was the what was the song independence day about i mean look what show was that about wait let me find that again um what was what show was independence day about so um that you know independence day is one of the things that's kind of funny and legendary about that song it's a very short song and we made a video for it which has in that video Christina Lee McCarthy wow um, so so there's a I'm connecting coming up on my show it. next week yeah <laughs> that's why I'm giving you your little promo plug there yeah so ask her about that so it's got Lance Mountain the famous skateboarder who we all grew up uh -huh. idolizing uh mm -hmm. one of the characters in this short video and then Christine who obviously was a you know wildly successful actor um and uh, she was in that, in, uh, and our manager at the time is, is the other guy wearing a wig in that. But um, anyway, it's a short song, like a minute and 10 seconds or something. And um, it was the shortest song ever played on MTV. That's its <laughs> the fame. Uh, it's like Time Magazine did a story about, you know, the, the history of MTV and, and Michael Jackson Thriller was the longest video and, um, and Down By Law. Independence Day was the shortest video, uh, but but anyway, it's a song about a riot that happened, um, uh, you know, at the uh, at the channel. Actually, that was a at song. That got, yeah, so the Youth Brigade show that kind of ended up kind of all higgled, you know, just just crazy. Do you remember that? Um, I don't know if I, I was around for that. I, I, that doesn't yeah, ring a bell. Crazy. Uh, did you guys? Did you guys play? I, mean, I don't even remember if we played. Uh, to be honest with you. Um, but I just remember it was during the Youth Brigade set and uh, not DC Youth Brigade, but the LA Youth Brigade. Yeah, yeah, and, of course. Uh -huh. and, and the bouncers went crazy on the kids and kids fought back and uh, it was crazy. I just remember, uh, you remember Sheena um, and 
she was one of the bouncers was was uh, grabbing her and trying to you know hurt her. And I went up to this guy who's easily twice my size, you know, and uh, I was a you know a buck ten wet, you know, weight wise. And you know, I tried to pull him off of her, and he turned around, let her go at least, and that was good. But uh, you know, it, it was crazy, it's everything. Yeah. Well, also, you know, I, I remember I remember an incident at the Rat where the Rat bouncers got their hands on you. And, uh, and, you know, I, I always, I always, I, I'll never forget that. I'll never forget that because, you know, people, people, um, uh, try to, um, hold, hold on a second. Yeah. People try to, um, I don't want to say Stalinize history, but you know, things, you know, you know, things get sort of changed up a little bit and, one of the things that people wax nostalgic about is the rat in Boston. And people mm -hmm. are like, oh, the rat, it was so great. Yo, I never let that go for a second. I'm always like, yo, fuck that place. That place was fucked. And they fucking, those fucking bouncers who were, were, who were fucking hooligans, man. They were fucking tough Irish Boston boxing guys that just like to hurt people. And I, I'm always like, yo, fuck that place. Yo, you know, they fucking, they beat up my fucking friend, Dave Smalley. And I'll never forget that, man, that, that kind of shit. And we hated, we hated the fucking bouncers at the rat, man. And people are like, oh, the rat, I miss it so much. Yo, fuck that place and fuck those guys. Yeah, I was, especially in the early days, it was pretty rough. So that show that you're talking about was one of SSD Control's early shows. And yeah. at that time, people didn't understand or know about, you know, uh, slam dancing. Right. So, so they still had tables pushed yeah. up almost to the front yeah. of the stage. And so there are about, you know, 15 of us or whatever. And we, were, we were slamming and somebody knocked over one of the tables and the bouncers just went crazy. Just great. Yeah. Like we didn't even, we weren't even prepared for what, you know, what happened and they went nuts. And I remember like the bouncer took my head and slammed it against the wall like, I didn't even know I was, I didn't even know we were in a fight. Right. And then he, you know, boom. And, and then, uh, and then he threw me out and two of them grabbed me and threw me out. And then another guy named JT got thrown out and his eye was, was cut and, and just lying on, on the floor or on the ground outside the rat, which is not a place where you want to be with your face on the ground, you know? So he's lying, staring at me with blood pouring down out of his eye. I've got blood pouring off of my head looking at him with my my head on the ground and Katie the cleaning lady came and took care of us and rescued us and got us all stitched up and fixed up and then uh, Jamie SSD Jamie uh I remember him trying to throw yeah, his here's the one two punch Alboril the, the the rat sucks and then yeah. Jamie Jamie the rat bouncer sucked <laughs> yeah 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 yep. yep they did but Jamie to his I will never forget that moment as I'm like trying to punch this guy off of me. Jamie throws his base down, trying to come out and, and rescue me. And two other bouncers grabbed him and threw him back on stage. Yep. They're going to let him join off. Yeah. Yeah. I see Al. Yep. yep. So I, I'll, I'll never forget that show or that night, obviously, you know. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's why I, I, I'll never let that slide because that's something like, seeing like, you know, my friend like bleeding profusely from his head, you know, being beaten up by guys that were twice our size, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll never forget that. And, and I'll never yeah, and The thing that really kind of was terrible about it was no warning. Right. So it wasn't really yeah. like fair. It wasn't a fair thing. Like they just, we, we didn't even know what was happening all of a sudden we were just grabbed from behind and stuff. So yep. kind of cowardly, you know? Yep. Um, there, yep. So. so, um, heading down the home stretch here. Um, one thing as we're heading, as we're almost done here, and, and I want to thank you for coming on the show. It was a lot of fun. We, we could do this for, you know, another hour, but, you know, everybody got to get on. Um, hold on. I was, I was 11 and saw the jam at the Rat in 77 and the police in 79 because my sister was dating the bartender, but fuck the bouncers. Yes, exactly. GBHD, GBHDYS was a great show. I have pictures from that show deep in the archive. From I got pictures of mm -hmm. DYS yeah. and GBH. Yeah, yeah. 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 yep. That that nice. played that show. But so here's a picture. Um, let, let, let's. It, it couldn't be a Dave Smalley show. 
without without talking about this a little bit. And let's talk a little bit for a minute about straight edge. And here's a picture from you back in the day. Uh, I have another picture, but this is the inf this is the smiley face with the X on the forehead shirt that that I loved. And um, you were one of those original straight edge guys. Um, I wasn't an original straight edge guy. Um, I tried, but um, you were you you were you were a straight edge guy. Where does straight edge um, sit with you these days? Um, what give us your your take on straight edge now that you were a straight edge kid when you were a teenager? Here we are almost 40 years later. Uh, give me your, your take on it. Yeah, so, so you know, great question. Um, it, I think straight edge is, is, uh, is an is a approach to life, right, which um, it's individually unique to each person, what that means. I mean, some people took straight edge further. You know, the earth crisis, cats, you know, um, took it to mean vegan. Um, you know, there were, there were also, you know, things about, um, you know, physical intimacy, you know, uh, you know, rules as it were, you know, so, so those were all kinds of things that, um, that people added onto it. But for me, it was always just about, uh, look, how can I be the best I can be? How can I make a, a positive dent? How can I not be the kind of people that we were seeing at the end of the seventies who were, you know, even some of my idols were just drugged out, right? Or like, you know, you lose guys like Hendrix or or Keith Moon, you know, um, you know Jim Morrison, some some you know some of the most famous rock stars, um, you know, get lost to to drugs. It's ruined many a band, many a relationship, many a uh, job, many a um, you know band. So so it's just to me, there's no good that comes out of that. Um, I'm not going to say that everybody should be, you know, the exact same, right? Uh, because you talk about Hendrix or Keith Moon, they probably wouldn't have been who they were without that stuff. But for us coming out of the 70s and seeing the excesses and, the, you know, um, the stuff that was going on, um, it wasn't for us. We were like trying to rebel against a lot of things. And the best way to do that was to not be messed up. And um, so to me, straight edge has always been a, a, a tool to be used to better achieve great things in life. Um, you know, I mean, you've got one of your sponsors is a vegan, um, you know, a vegan restaurant, right? Uh -huh. that, that's a tool. You can use that tool because um, certainly, you know, people who, who are vegans, uh, you know, they're not taking in a lot of, ingesting in a lot of stuff that carnivores ingest, mm -hmm. right? With, so there's a great uh, asset, I think, to being vegan, you know, and, and so, um, I am not vegan, but I, I understand the value of it. And so um, I just think straight edge is a is a tool to use at whatever age. You can be 55 or you can be 20 or whatever it is. But, um, you know, there's there's better ways than than uh, for me. There's better things to do with my time and my body. Yeah, man. It's interesting. It's interesting because when I in those early in the in the early 80s coming out of New York and stuff and it was, you know, drinking and drugging was a real part of the culture that, that, that I came up in. And then the hardcore thing and hanging out with the bad brains. And I just couldn't, I tried, but I just, I was too attached to sort of that lifestyle in a certain way. What's interesting is, you know, I'm clean and sober now many, many years. So I, I think in the same way that for some people being straight edge as a teenager is makes sense for them being being straight edge or clean and sober you know in, in, in for me as 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 an adult made more sense made made a lot of sense to me i i just i just lost interest in it eventually you know yeah and you know the other thing too about i think drugs and drinking um particularly drugs though in this discussion is if it was ever cool for people when they were young like let's say you know, a Keith Moon or a Jim Morrison or a Jimi Hendrix, um, you know, it's way less cool. It's like a smoker, right? Like, like people who smoke, you think of John, uh, James Dean, right? James, uh -huh. Dean, you know, smoking, right? Yeah. But then you think about, a, 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 you know, a 70 year old with a emphysema, uh, you know, uh, gear attached to them and it's not so romantic or cool anymore. And, and so, 
uh, even one thing at one age is often uh, in life changes with time. And I think that's definitely the case with, with drugs and drinking is that, you know, uh, whatever you might've done when you're 19 or 20 or 25, it's not so cool or smart to do that, you know, uh, for somebody who's, you know, 45 or 50 or whatever. So, um, you know, yeah. keep living hard for those people who did that in 1982, Right, like you can't live like that and and live and survive very seldom when you're when you're 45. Right, like that's going to catch up with you. And uh, I've seen a lot of people that I knew and loved and respected go down hard or die. Who tried yeah, for, to, you know? Yeah, for sure. And here's here's Alexander Luchet. Mushrooms saved my life, so I would never denounce drugs, bro. I'm not denouncing drugs, and I no. did plenty of mushrooms, you know, back in the day, and and much 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 much. A lot. And uh, I did a lot. And uh, I'm not denouncing drugs or anything. No, I'm not either. Like I said, yeah. I, don't think, I don't think a lot of people would be who they were without it. So it's an individual yeah. choice. And we are, we are, look, this world is made up of, of however many, you know, however many, you know, people there are of 3.5 billion. I don't remember what the number is of people in this world. There's a lot of different people, a lot of different things in life. Nobody should try to be the same as everybody else, right? And some religions like Rastafarians, that is a part of their religion. Some people, it's something that gives them great enjoyment. So nobody should, you know, should be uh, holier than thou because nobody's holier. And I know a lot of people who have been not straight edge who are really great people. And I've known a few people who are straight edge who aren't that nice. So um, I, I take the non straight edge great person over the mean, nasty straight edge person if I, if I, see both of those people in the room. Yeah. Uh, here's an interesting, here's an interesting, uh, from Jurassic punk. I'm over 12 years sober, but never would refer to myself as being straight edge. I hear that I'm, I'm about 12 years sober and you know, I don't go, I'm straight edge, you know, it's, you know, I kind of just, yeah. over. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just kind of over it. Al, and, and our friend Al Barrill says many people have reasons why they need to escape. And Al says, I get it. Yeah, man. It, it, it's, it's uh, listen. Straight edge is a, is a whole bit. Hey Sid, I see you out there, Sid, and you're coming on the show in, in a couple of minutes. So get ready. Sid, um, my brother. Yeah, I'm gonna bring I'm gonna bring on some of my guys, uh, Dave, and uh, let let them say a word. And and uh, you know, it's been a fun show, and thank you so much for being a part of it. Uh, thank you, brother. Yeah, man. What's happening, Stephen? Thank you, Japan. What's, What's up around the world? I really appreciate. It. What's up, Sid? I got a. Dave, hey, I want to just say... What up, Dave? What's going on? Hey, brother. How are you, man? I'm, I'm good. Listen, I got to Go tell you. Steve, what's up, brother? Drew's always done the 10 questions with everybody. And he always asks what your first hardcore show was. And I'm trying to think of the timeline. But mine was either Dag Nasty or The Crumb Suckers. And you played at a place on Long Island... You were supposed to play a place called Des Sons, right in my town in Comac. And me and my buddy, uh, Rich Ramirez, the drummer from Nine Lives, went to the venue and there was a, a sign on the door that said, the band is not playing tonight, they changed venues. And you played at a place, I think it was called Northern Lights. And there was- Northern Lights, Northern, Northern Lights was in, um... If I remember Northern Lights is is up on isn't that up in the New York State Thruway Northern Lights? No, 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 no. This is no. right on Long Island. This is in oh, okay. County. Okay, go ahead. It was like go a ahead. little tiny place, and there might have been, I swear to God, if there was 20 people there, we were sitting down. Everyone was like sitting around the band. It was this amazing show. And we were sitting right by Brian Baker. And it's one of the few shows I have in, in my life that I did not have a camera for. And I've shot 90% <laughs> of the shows I've ever been to. And it kills me to this day. And uh, it, cause it was this like private show because a lot of people didn't end up coming because they didn't see the venue change. And, uh, and it was this incredible moment. And, and I wish to this day, I've always looked to see if anyone else had pictures. And I don't know if you remember at all uh, playing on the, on Long Island. Um, you know, honestly, I don't remember that show per se, but I remember, so for me, my time in, in Dag Nasty, I remember certain shows, but 
uh, a lot of it was just like this blur of energy and fury and, um, you know, <laughs> like it all kind of just, you know, there was a, there was, like I said before, where there was a certain calm that up of that band at that time, um, that it, it was uh, something special. And, um, so I, if you brought me to that venue and, and then I would probably automatically remember it, but, uh, all I really remember from DAG are just moments. It's like flashing lights. I remember flashing lights. Right, like, ah. like paparazzi, flashing lights. That's my memories of Dagnasty. Just moments of explosions of brightness. Uh, <laughs> that's that's know? a cool. That's cool. Just flashes of like like snapshots, you know. Yeah. It, it was such a great such a great show, and and it really sticks with sticks with me to this day because it was it was easily one of the first two or three hardcore shows that I'd ever seen at that point, and. Uh, Nice, bro. Thank you, brother. It was Thank really you. something, and it's and again having you know having you know being able to tell you and being able to talk to you. I mean, uh, is awesome. You know, I mean, having seen you play Webster Hall with you know with Don't Sleep and everything, and uh, it yeah, always brings cool. me back to that show. You know, awesome. And, uh, Thank you. Awesome. That means a lot. Really what's good. Up with, what's up with you, Sid? Uh, just getting home early from work, actually. Dave, I wanted to say that DYS show you did years ago at Bowery Electric was one of the best shows I've ever seen you play. Those, oh, kids, wow. those kids went fucking nuts at that show. And that span at least a good, Jesus, like seven, eight years ago, that show comes yeah, I have the flyer. I have the flyer right here. It was uh, nice. Janu January 2nd, 2011. DYS Antidote. Razor blade, hand grenade, free spirit, skull crusher, stick together, and united youth. Yeah, that was nice. A, that was fucking insane. Thank you, Sid. We played a we played we played a few shows together, Dave. Antidote, yeah, we, yeah. we played, we played more, to come, that, more to come. Yo, we played that one in L.A. where the fucking where that brawl broke out when Antidote was playing. That was fun. <laughs> yeah, you know what can you do? What can you do? Hey, um, listen, Dave, bro, I want to thank you for coming on the show. You're one of my oldest friends in this hardcore thing. I love you. I wish you all the best, man. Thank you, man. Thank you so much, Sid, Steve. Great to see you guys. Uh, I encourage your audience to, uh, to, 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 you know, find the, uh, the ability to, to just, you know, support the show. And, you know, we all, of course, we all support things emotionally, but, uh, people got to pay bills and, and, uh, you know, um, if you really want the arts to survive, think of all the shows you haven't gone to uh, in the last, you know, three or four or five months and that you probably won't be going to for the next three or four or five months. Think about all the money you would have spent on tickets and T-shirts and a drink or whatever else you would have gotten. So uh, why, don't you, why don't you take what you would have spent just at one show, right, and, and, and donate and, and donate to this show, um, you know, and keep it going. So... So uh, you know that's that's my plug for for what we come from as as a roots uh, you know hardcore roots and uh, you know those two guys on the bottom of my screen as well as you obviously Drew are my brothers so uh, yeah much Thank love you. I'll I'll see you soon and and when the dust settles don't sleep is coming to play the A seven right deal yep confirmed yes. all right buddy I love you I'll talk to you soon all right. take care Thank you man thanks for having me. Well, there you go. There's uh, Dave Smalley, our old friend. Uh, that was awesome. I hope you enjoyed it uh, as much as uh, as much as we did. Uh, that that was that was pretty uh, that was pretty great. Um, is that you, Matt Gray? That is. Is that you, Matt Gray? I think it is. You know. Um, what's this from Al Burrell? Look forward to seeing Dave and Drew in 2024. Is that when SSD Control is playing shows, Al, in 2024? Is, is, that, is that right? All right, buddy. Um, great show. Thank you, Mark. Um, three more minutes and you break your longest show record. I know. I gotta, I, I, you got you to gotta get off. Um, you, you guys. Uh, we can we'll, do we'll, it. We, listen, um, I'll see you guys. Uh, what? We got a show on Friday with, um, with Lukey Luke. Oh, yeah. And uh, Saturday, I'll see you in Tompkins Square Park, come rain or shine. And then Sunday, we have Steve Zing, right? Uh, oh, you're yeah. going to be with us on Sunday? Oh, yeah. All right, cool. Sid, I'll see you later. All right, hey, cool. Hey, Drew. Yeah, man. You, got, you know what?
You got to do when when A seven opens up again. You got to do an all Boston A seven show. Yeah, we we did we did a you thing know, when, with when we did SSD a thing. Control does the reunion show. We did a thing with the FUs and 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 um and Jerry and um Jer and what's his name uh, Bob Sensi from Jerry's Kids. Yeah, that was a great show. You know, yep. that was a great show. I was there. Thank you, May. I'm glad you enjoyed the show. Get some sleep. Happy Jack. Thanks for stopping by, Rick. Thank you so much, Rick. Um, Frank, uh, Frankie, too far. Um, thank you, bro. I appreciate it. Appreciate everybody, man. Listen, you know, every everybody knows. See you on Saturday in the park, uh, Rich. And uh, you know, listen. Uh, just a quick thing. I know the straight edge thing always stirs up a little bit of uh, it, it's it's a hot topic, but you know, we we went we went there we went there for a minute. Listen, man, my show, this show here, you know, we're, we're not trying to get in. We're not trying to get into too many hot topics here. You know, we're trying to trying to keep it light and keep it entertaining. And, you know, we could do it. We could do a straight edge show and get into all that shit, you know, uh, uh, you know, all that shit, <laughs> you know, but listen, it, it, it is, it is what it is. And uh, I appreciate everybody. I appreciate everybody hanging in. Robert Hogg, your fucking shirt's on the way, bro. And I fucking paid for it. Um, thank you, Central Scrutinizer. Good show, par usual. Uh, Chris Corkum, uh, nice to see you. And I saw that you mentioned the Dead Kennedys. Um, you mentioned the Dead Kennedys at Emerson College in the, um, in the cafeteria. You know what, Chris Corkum? Hold on a second, everybody. Uh -huh. I'm, I'm going to find that picture, man. Where is where is that picture? Um, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. I'm coming. No, not that one. All right. Hang out. Not that one. I'm getting closer, kids. Not that one. There's, I'm looking for the shot of the dead Kennedys. Bingo. Here we go. Here's a shot right here. This is this is for Chris. This is for Chris Corkum. Uh, yo, your shirt's on the way, Chris. And you know what? Actually, Chris, your fucking shirt. Is that your right address? 45 Silver Lane in Levittown, New York. Does now we all know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> the post office uh, couldn't figure that address out. Is that is that right, Chris? Anyway. Yo, here you go, Chris Corkum. Now this, I told the story about how at Emerson College in the cafeteria, I met a Choke from Slapshot, uh, later in Slapshot, and I went to my first hardcore show, SSD Control Show. The year before I got there, the Dead Kennedys played this very same cafeteria. And our friend Chris Corkum, where is that shot? Right here is a shot. This is a fill and flash shot. And you can see this is a never before seen, a never before seen shot. Let me get these banners off so we can really, we can really uh, give it a view here. And uh, boom, there's there's Chris Corkum. You could see him to the right of Jello Biafra. He, I don't know what he's wearing. He's wearing if he's got makeup on. He's got like black across his eyes there. But you see him. In front there of the speakers. Look at him. That's Chris Corkum. And uh, there he is right there. So, yep, photos exist, man. Yeah, I use I used this photo in the uh, in the Boston Hardcore film. Went deep into the archive. Deep into the archive. Huh? Jamie's to be wife I met at that show. Yes, Angie, Jamie from SSD Control's wife. Chucky, nice to hear from you. Cool episode. Um that's right, Robert Hogg. Your fucking shirt's on the way. Don't bust my black leather. Black leather across your eyes? Is that across? Like it's across your eyes, bro. Let me see. I, I can't blow up the photo, but um, there it is. Is that a black leather mask you're wearing? What the fuck? <laughs> and anyway, um, there Reach you go. On. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, just imagine how threatening Dead Kennedys was to a band name in the 80s for someone in Boston. Could you imagine, Warlord? That's crazy, man, right? Like, listen, I was in Boston in 1981. Dead Kennedys 
was was a, a name of a band that like you know you you wore a dead Kennedy's butt and people like you know, wanted to kill you. They wanted to fucking smash your head into the pavement, you know. So yeah, Nick, we'll see we'll see you on Saturday. Um, that said, look, I got to end the show. Um, Stephen, I think we broke the record. I think we did two hours and 15 minutes. This was the welcome. This is the welcome back to New York show. Um, I'll talk to you later. Um, I'm doing a tech check with Lukey Luke later. If you want to stop by, um, you got it. So I'll see you later on. Well, thanks everyone. That was a hell of a show. Uh, it's great to be back in New York. I want to thank our guest, Dave Smalley. And of course, show regular Stephen Messina and Sid the Kid for stopping by. But most of all, I want to thank everybody out there for making the show success, uh, a show of success, and for chiming in. Uh, it's great. And, uh, well, Chris Corkum, this was the last tour dates for fresh fruit for rotting vegetables. Yep, yep. That, that's, what, that's what we do. Whoa. Al and, I decided to start, Al and I decided to start a band together at that show. How about another picture from that show? It's the show that wouldn't die. This is a never before seen photo from that show. This is um, this is Dead Kennedys in my fucking college cafeteria. Wow, I never, you know, I never noticed, I never noticed that upside down flag in, in that photo as well. So uh, there you go. Um, broke the record, longest show we've ever done, and it's a new world record. So there you go. Thanks again, of course. Thanks a lot, everybody. Um, it was a hell of a show. I missed everybody. I'm back in New York. Uh, the A7 shows are for sale at www.stonefilmsnyc.com. Thank you for supporting the show. I will see you soon. Do good things, and good things will come to you.